And now, this is our helper saying, don't miss the warm-up sessions before the game of the day, and this summer, don't strike out because your hair is dried out. Use you by Dallas with wonder-working V7, the greatest grooming discovery that does wonders for your hair. By Dallas. In just a moment, the game will get underway. The Fall Staff Brewing Corporation of St. Louis, Omaha, New Orleans, and San Jose brews a premium quality Fall Staff beer, and their distributors everywhere join in bringing you tops in baseball. Mutual's Game of the Day. between the seventh place St. Louis Browns in the American League and the battling third place Chicago White Sox. Six and a half games off the pace being set by the New York Yankees. And the first hitter up here for the St. Louis Browns will be Johnny Grove, hitting at 2 5 1. He's a right handed batter playing center field for the Brownies under Marty Marion. And the good old sidekick along with me this afternoon, Old Pot Gleason. So between the two of us, we'll be trying to dish this one out for you this afternoon from Comiskey Park in Chicago. You'll hear it in just a minute. There's a pitch to the plate. Fast ball by Rogerman. He's swung on. Hit down to the right side of Nelly Fox. The second baseman doubles it up. Fires the first base in time. And Gross is out on one pitch ball. Well, that happened pretty quick, all right? If the rest of the ball game's this fast, that's all, brother. Yes, sir. That Fox has really been great, Al, down this drive. The right stops have been making. Boy, I want you to know that that boy hustles with that second base block any time. Any time he's in uniform, got a pair of spikes on, he's out there running. So here's a guy who can cuff that ball for you. For the St. Louis Browns, their left-hand hitting right fielder, Dick Kokus. He stands about uh, three-quarters deep in batter's box, opens the stance down towards first base, and big tall Rogerman fires a fast ball at him and gets it over for a call strike. The broadcast, authorized under the broadcasting rights granted by the Chicago White Sox, solely for the entertainment of our listening audience. And any uh, broadcast, rebroadcast of this ball game without the express consent of the White Sox is prohibited. Now the pitch to the plate to Kokus. And it rides low, and it counters one ball and one strike. Dick Kokus batting at 268. He's the second man up for the Browns here. As Rogerman pitches, Kokus swings. There's a high fly ball hung out into right field. Going back deep for it, right up against the board. Leaping, he cannot get it. It's into the right field stand for a home run. Dick Kokus, a home run. Lost it into the right field stand here to put the Browns out in front. One to nothing. Sam Neely went back, leaped high on the boards and couldn't get it. That's the 15th run batted in. For Kokus. Hit number one, run number one off Saul Rogerman. That ball didn't look as though it was going to fall in there at all. It was sort of lofted high. Dick Kokus comes along and gets the first home run for the Browns in the month of July. That brings his total to four now. That's the 42nd home run the Browns have manufactured to date. Now hitting right-handed is Roy Stevers batting at 232. Swings on the first pitch and hits it right back to the mound. Rogerman grabs it, fires it over to Payne at first base, and that is the second out here in the top first inning. Well, this ball game has gone boom, boom, boom so far. The left fielder, batting number four in the order, is the right-hand hitter, Don Lenhart. Lenhart hitting at 284. One to nothing in favor of the St. Louis Browns. Kokus lofting a home run into the right field stand. 352 feet away from home plate. Rogerman kicks, delivers a fastball, fires through at the knees to Don Lenhart for strike one call. One to nothing in favor of the St. Louis Browns. Last night, the Browns stopped the winning streak of the Chicago White Sox. Beat them four to two. Pitch to the plate is over. Nice curveball. Called strike two. Don Lenhart's a big guy. Stands about three quarters deep to the plate. Straight away stands to the pitcher. Big Rogerman, who is trying for his fifth one of the year, and right now is one run behind. Rogerman has won four and has lost nine. The fellow throws a fast curveball, swung on and missed for strike three. And that is all for Lenhart here and the Browns in the top half of the first inning. 
One big run for St. Louis. On one base hit, Coker's fourth home run of the year lost it into the right field stand with the bases empty. There were no errors, and nobody was left on. So the score at the end of the first half of the first inning. The St. Louis Browns won, and the now coming to bat Chicago White Sox, nothing. For the last half of inning number one, it'll be Clark, the second baseman, followed by Ferris Payne, the first baseman. Minnie Minoso, the left fielder, will be the number three hitter for the White Sox. And if anyone else is needed... Then we'll have the number four hitter in the order, Bob Elliott. That's the veteran Bob Elliott, who was with the Browns before being dealt over here to the White Sox just a few days back. Already now on Mutual's Game of the Day for the last half of the first inning with the Chicago White Sox, the third place ball club in the American League. Six and a half games off the pace being set for the sliding Yankees. By the way, they're only uh, five games out in front of those Cleveland Indians now. And the Yankees last night lost the ball game. Means now that they've lost eight straight. Milwaukee last night picked up a win in the second game from uh, Cincinnati. And that's why night doubleheader. So they stopped their losing streak at eight. And the Yankees have eight. And they're, uh, they'll be attempting to uh, stop their losing streak in today's play. We'll have the other scores of the other ball games, starting pitches and so forth for you in just a moment. Art's working on them, and uh, as soon as he has them, well, we'll be ready. Dick Littlefield is going to pitch now to Nelson Fox, left hand hitting first baseman, batting at 261 for the pale hose. We'll set the Browns for you defensively in just a moment. Littlefield pitching, delivers, and Fox takes a fastball, five through first strike. Behind the plate is Clint Courtney. First base is Roy Sieber. The second baseman for the Browns, Bob Young. The shortstop is Bill Hunter. A third is Bob Elliott. Curve ball to Fox is low and outside. His count is one ball and one strike. Out in left field is Big Don Lenhart for the Browns. The center fielder is Johnny Grove. And in right field, we have Dick Cokett. Played umpire Charlie Berry. Looking down over the shoulder, Flint Courtney. As Littlefield, the left-handed pitches. Fox swings on it, drives one into right field. And is in there for a base hit, going all the way back to the wall. Nelson Fox is on his way to second. Look at that little fellow run. Poles in there standing up with a two-backer. Nelson Fox driving one off the wall in right field for a base hit. So he made a pair of bases on that one, and coming up, hitting left-handed, is Ferris Payne. Payne batting at 270. He was last year's American League batting champion. Mark, did you ever see anybody run so fast with little chopping steps as that uh, Fox did just now? He was really churning, wasn't he? Oh, my. He was really picking them up and laying them down. Nelson Fox jumps around like a batty rooster and runs like one. Runs like a scared rabbit. What little field touch again? Two left hand batting Ferris Payne. High off the face for ball one. Hartley sure had a fine time down at Fort Worth yesterday. Uh, to catch ballpark. Really fun. And the fastball swung on by Payne, a line drive, hit out into right field. Dick Cocus comes up to it, has the range, grabs it, throws in, and there goes Nelson Fox tagging up, going into third sliding. There's Payne is out on the line drive to Dick Cocus in right field. Fox tagging up and moving over on the line drive to third. Now we have Minoso. Minoso is the number 10 hitter in the American League, percentage-wise. His batting percentage stands at 3.07. Hits him right-handed, and with one out, the dying run is on his third base. A one to nothing ball game in favor of the St. Louis Browns, who walked out here in the first inning and took it. Hit a home run, his fourth of the year. End of the right field stand to put the Browns out in front, one to nothing. Little field in danger of losing that one run advantage. Gets ready to pitch now to right hand batting Minnie Minoso. Enfield pulls up, hoping, of course, to get a chance to cut Fox down at the plate. There's a change up curveball thrown by Little Field and Minoso off the hands inside for ball one. Little Field works again. Minoso swings on. There's a bounding ball to second. Young is up with it. Drives the runner back to third base, fires over to first in time, and Minoso is out. So that brings on Bob Elliott, batting a 261. Bob Elliott coming up there, hitting right-handed. That's 
Walker, yesterday at the Fort Worth Ball Club. We had quite a time at LaGray Field, along with Dizzy Dean, Gene Kirby, and Carl Jonas. Spencer Harris, the president of the Fort Worth Cats Ball Club, is a terrific coach. Certainly uh, did put it on for us yesterday. We deeply appreciate it. Everything that uh, happened to us in Fort Worth yesterday. Ready for the first pitch now to the right hand hitter Elliott. In the drive, high off the face for ball one. Bob has a nobody close stand, feet wide spread apart. In comes the pitch. Let up curveball over to knees. On the count on Elliott, there's one ball and one strike. One and one. Texas runner third. That's the tying runner third. Fox is on there. Doubled. And then when Payne lined out to right, he took third. He's been there ever since. Third ball swung on by Elliott. There's a hard hit ground ball at shortstop. Hunter's up with it. Fires the first base in time. And Littlefield gets out of the inning. So there was a big threat going here in the last half of the first inning, but no score. No runs on this one base hit. One man was left to win no errors. And the score at the end of one full inning of play. The Browns won, the home-standing Chicago White Sox, nothing. Well, now, fans, we'd like to take time out for a minute between innings to say a very sincere thanks. Thanks for your friendly words of appreciation for these broadcasts. But, of course, we couldn't bring you this play-by-play without the support of the fault staff folks. So, if you want to say thanks to them, just ask for fault staff when it's time for beer. You can't do better. Just like its gold premium label says, it's premium quality beer. The choicest product of the brewer's life. Now we walk into the top half of the second inning here at Comiskey Park in Chicago. The sun has been lost for the moment as once again an overhanging cloud has come between the sun and the folks here in the ballpark. Talking about the folks in the ballpark, let's receive the wire from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. From short card Harry and all the fans down there. Saying that they uh, listened yesterday to mutual game of the day out of Fort Worth. And if they listen every day to Mutual's Game of the Day down at Fort Lauderdale, and we're very happy. He said that they're hoping that the Fort Lauderdale Lions stay up on top in the Florida International League for Pepper Martin's sake. Well, old Pepper Martin's quite a boy. Got himself quite a manager down there. Very colorful gentleman. And the gentleman he is. We're ready now for the first pitch here of the top half of the second inning. Clint Courtney batting at 256. All right, he's hit safely in how many ball games now? Uh, I think he's 8 for 12. He's hitting over, he's raised his average 50 points in this road trip, Al. How about that, huh? Little left-hand hitter goes after the first pitch and up to foul off the handle of the bat for strike one. Saul Rogerman pitching here for the White Sox this afternoon. Down comes the next pitch, over. That's called strike two. No ball, two strikes. We're in the first half of inning number two. Courtney to be followed by Dyke and then by Young. One to nothing in favor of the St. Louis Browns. Rogerman ready, delivers a fastball right off Courtney's kneecap. That's ball one. One ball and two strikes. We were speaking a moment ago about the Florida International League. Just before I left the hotel, phone rang, and on the other end of it was a guy by the name of Ben Chapman. I know you remember Ben. Quite a figure in Major League Baseball. There's a curveball to Courtney High. Counted two and two. And just as soon as we find out with what happens with Courtney, I want to tell you what Ben Chapman, the manager of the Tampa Smokers of the Florida International League, told me on the phone. I really think it's something I'd like to pass it along to you fans. Now for the 2-2 pitch. Rogerman takes his time from Red Wilson, his battery mate. Here's the 2-2 delivery. Rogerman's fastball is swung on by Courtney, dragged down to the right side. Chain deep behind first up with it. Fires to Rogerman covering, and Courtney is out. So we have one away here in the top of the second inning. Well, Ben Chapman 
said on the phone to me just about an hour and a half ago, he said, Al, we think something's happened down here that you'd like to know about. I said, what's that, Ben? He said, a group of businessmen and civic leaders in the city of Tampa have purchased, they've bought the franchise of the Tampa Smokers, and they've turned it into a non-profit organization. All the profits, all the money that will be made by the smokers, from here on out, will go to all charitable organizations, such as the Boys Club and the Institution for the Blind and things of that sort. And I don't think this has ever been done in baseball before. I think they're setting the pace for things of this nature down at uh, Tampa, Florida. I would like to send our congratulations along, at least for the experiment. We'll be tried by some civic-minded men and businessmen down in the city of Tampa. By the way, tomorrow at the uh, Floridan Hotel, they're going to have a meeting at 7.30 o'clock, and we sincerely hope that you folks down around Tampa who are interested in this venture will get over to the meeting because the doors will be thrown open and you'll be able to come in. Now hitting right-handed will be Jimmy Dyke batting at 204. And the first pitch to Jimmy Dyke of the Browns here is a fastball low for ball one. Rides the next pitch over. The count is one ball and one strike. Jimmy Dyke, out for his first at bat of the day. We're in the second inning, one out, nobody on. The Browns are bat and leading in the ball game, one to nothing. Roland starts that gangly pumping motion of his. Kick high, delivers a curveball, swung on, hit down, dropped it to shortstop. Up with it is Marsh. The throw to Ferris Payne at first base by a stride, and that's all for Dyke. In case you're wondering what happened with Chico Carcel, he's not in the lineup this afternoon for the White Sox. Chico's riding the bench with a bad leg. His ankle was twisted uh, rather severely, so he's not in the lineup. So Freddie Marsh is playing for him. Now Bob Young, the second baseman of the Browns, comes up there. He's batting a 264, hitting left-handed. That's where I'm very interested, Art, to find out how uh, they're going to make out with those smokers. Turning it into a non-profit organization and strictly for charity. And he gets a magnificent move on the part of the Tampa Ball Club in the Florida International League. Now ready for the first pitch here to Bob Young. Rutherford cuts it loose. It's high across the bridge of the nose for ball one. Two outs, nobody on. Top half the second inning, score one to nothing in favor of the Browns. Rutherford works, the fastball swung on, hit out of the right center field. There's a pretty well-tagged ball, that might be in there. It is up against the right center field wall. On his way to second base is Young, and holds up there with a stand-up two-bagger. He really smacked that one for two bases. In the right center field, right up against the wall. That has to be hit about 400 feet from home plate. So there is hit number two of Rogerman. And the batter coming up is Bill Hunter, the shortstop. Hunter is batting at 261. Well, I've got to say this, Art, that both of these hits that have come off Saul Rogerman have really been tagged. Well, that wind's helping him a little bit too up there, Al. Yeah, that's for sure, right? Sweet. We're going to watch this guy intensely. They're not going to monkey around with Hunter. They're going to walk and get the little field. Well, there's ball one way outside. The order has been put out. Put the man on. While they're putting him on, we might run over uh, the results of last night's Major League scores in case your paper didn't get a chance to carry them. Some of the games were pretty late. Yesterday in the National League, Chicago defeated St. Louis 10-3. And Cincinnati took with Milwaukee. They won the first game 6-3 from the Braves. The second game was 1-6-4. Favor of Milwaukee. Second game went 10 innings, too. The Pittsburgh Pirates defeated New- the New York Giants last night 3 to 1. And in 10 innings, it was Philadelphia defeating Brooklyn 10 to 9. Over in the American League, St. Louis, as we told you, defeated the Chicago 4 to 2. Boston took New York 5 to 4. And Cleveland beat Detroit 6 to 4 in a ball game that was called at the end of the fifth inning because of rain. Washington and Porterfield shut out the Philadelphia Athletics last night, three to nothing, with Porterfield hitting a home run. So that brings us up to date with everything, and as far as the ball scores are concerned, well, as soon as we get an opportunity now, Art will have some scores for us, so we'll cut him loose. Oh, 
Potter is on, having been walked intentionally. And Dick Littlefield hitting left-handed is up there. Saul Rogerman fires a curveball at him, but just under the knees for ball one. So Rogerman is charged with one base on balls. However, it was ordered. Two down, two on here in the top of the second inning. Browns leading one to nothing. Rogerman works. A fastball fired in off the pitch right up against the body. Two balls, no strikes. That's the count on left-hand batting Dick Littlefield. Marty Marion, the manager of the St. Louis Browns, is running his ball club from the coach's box behind third. And see right now putting on all the signs. They're looking around, checking him. Now here's Rogerman checking his runners. Delivered through and over the plate. A fastball swung on and hit back through the middle for a base hit. Littlefield singles into right center field. Here comes the runner around third on into score. Oh, Littlefield comes through with a spike line drive into right center field to get himself an RBI. Oh, goodness, even the pitchers are raring up here this afternoon. That's run number two off Rogerman. Bill Young came tearing around third and right on into score on that one. Running right behind him, Bill Hunter, legs all the way into third base. And the batter coming up there now is Johnny Gross, the leadoff man. Two to nothing in favor of the St. Louis Browns. Talking with Bill Beck just before the uh, ball game started. He was down in the press room. Said he uh, just wanted to travel along with the ball club and see that everybody was out there going. Well, uh, you can see them out there going this afternoon. These Browns are determined. They won 27 ball games. They're trying to pick up their 28th this afternoon. Rogerman pitching to Johnny Gross, whom he got on the ground ball in the first inning to second base, delivers him a curveball inside off the chest for ball one. Rogerman in trouble here. Runners at first and third. One runner scored. Browns leading 2 nothing. Rogerman takes his time from Wilson. We have some activity now down in the bullpen for the Chicago White Sox. It looks like Dory warming up. They're out behind the center field fence in the bullpen. It's pretty hard to see them from here. Pitch the plate is over but low, and the count is two balls and no strikes on Johnny Grove. Also, Sandy Confligra throwing in the bullpen for the White Sox. Paul Richards will have a couple of guys on tap if Rogerman should uh, falter here anymore. Runners at first and third. The pitch is made and taken over the outside corner. Just waits high for a called strike. So Johnny Grove now has moved the count to two balls and one strike. We're in the first half of the second inning. Two out. One run has been scored. There are still two men on to the Browns. Second base is open. First is occupied by... Dick Littlefield, the pitcher who slammed in the run with a line drive single in the right center field. At third is Bill Hunter. There's a sidearm delivery that's over nicely on the outside slice at the knees for a called strike two. So the count on Grove now is two balls and two strikes. Grove calling for time with Charlie Berry. Allows it. Grove dries his hands and steps back in. It's hot here in Chicago this afternoon. Got a temperature hovering near the 100 degree mark. Wind blowing in from behind center field is just enough to keep the church dry, and that's about all. But it's warm. Everyone sitting around enjoying the sunshine. Runners the first and third taking lead. In comes the pitch. Swung on by Grove. There's a high pop up going out into short right center field. Nelson Fox, the second baseman, under it. Little fellas got it. There's out number three. So that's all here in the first half of the second inning, in which the Browns come up with one run on two base hits. There were no errors, and two men were left off. So the score at the end of one and a half innings of play, mutual game of the day from Comiskey Park in Chicago. It's the Browns two, and the homestanding Chicago White Sox nothing. <laughs> Oh,
Did you ever wonder what the players say when they gather round the mound? Now from all we've heard on the players' words, it's got a real familiar sound. All about all that beer, the right beer, yes, the reef, all that beer is premium quality. For it's the product of the brewer's heart, so sing out the ball that Sing out the ball that Sing out the ball that well, we're moving into the last half of the second inning, and before uh, we get started here, we have a minute or two time, so uh, let's get old Pop Gleason in here with some of the scores. All right, how about you, buddy? Right, Al, in the American League at the end of two innings, it's scoreless up at Fenway Park in Boston for the Yankees. Johnny Dean is pitching, and for Boston, Mel Parnell. Cleveland is playing at Detroit, not yet started, and Washington and Philadelphia are playing a night game. At the end of five innings, at Polo Grounds, New York, the Giants three, Pittsburgh one, Magley going for the Giants, Lindell for Pittsburgh, Milwaukee and Cincinnati not yet started, Philadelphia, Brooklyn, and Chicago, St. Louis, both night games. Al? All right, ready to go here with Rivera coming up to the plate. A left-hand hitter swings on the first pitch. It's a line drive into right field. Focus up to it. And tries to drop it. He can't get it. Gets by him. Rivera still running. Dives into third base, and he's there at third base. That'll undoubtedly go as a three-base hit. A three-base hit. The official score just comes up with it. A three-base hit for Jim Rivera. Pounded by Dick Cocos in right field. And you should have seen that Rivera diving into third. He lost no time whatsoever. And for the White Sox, that's their second hit in the ball game off Dick Littlefield. And now the potential first run for the White Sox is on at third base. And Sam Mealy, batting at 279, comes up there. Mealy has 34 runs batted in, has his opportunity of picking up his 35th right here and now. The infield on the left side, Bob, uh, Bob Depp, and they're playing shallow, despite the fact that this hitter up there is a right-handed batsman. Now we're ready to go. That is the sixth triple for Jim Rivera this year. He really pounded that one right by Dick Cocos, who came in fast and tried to trap a low-line drive, and it got by him. Bounce right over his shoulder, right out to the wall, the right field. Jim Rivera has kept right on traveling. Now the first pitch to the plate is over for a called strike to Sam Mealy. Travis Mealy watches a curve whistle by high and outside for ball one. One ball and one strike. Down rides the next pitch. Little field curveball is swung on and missed for strike two. One ball, two strikes. I feel the fan around the left of me, playing in deep. Sam will hit that long ball for you. to throw the fastball that's over at the knees for call strike three and Sam Mealy knew it. So there's the first out here in the second inning. That's for strike out for Littlefield. Red Wilson is coming up there now. Red Wilson's batting percentage is 272. He has the opportunity of getting the run in from third. The first White Sox run. The score stands 2-0 now in favor of the Browns. Wilson looks around to uh, get a sign of some kind. How was that? Littlefield delivers a slow curveball. Wilson after punches it into right field. Coming up to it is Dick Coker. Grabs that ball. There's the back up at third. Rivera's coming in. And he makes it sliding. He scores the run. will get his fifth run batted in. Now a two-to-one ball game in favor of the St. Louis Browns. The batter 
Carter is Brady Mark hitting in 222, the shortstop for the White Sox this afternoon. Two to one in favor of the Browns. As Marsh steps up there, hitting right-handed. Freddie Marsh was with the Browns, do you recall? He stands away from the plate and steps into the pitches. Steps into this one, swings on it. There's a high fly ball hung into deep left field. Don Lenhart goes back. The wind's got the ball, but Lenhart stays with it and makes the catch for out number three. So that's all here for the White Sox, but they get into the run column. On one base hit, one run, one base hit. No errors and nobody left on. So the score at the end of two full innings of play. The St. Louis Browns two and the Chicago White Sox have won. Well, say, neighbor, here's the simplest recipe for real deep down pleasure you ever heard. Just take a cold, frosty bottle or can of premium quality fall staff in your hand. And slowly pour that clear golden beer into a glass. And let it rise and cap itself with creamy white foam. And finally, taste false that remarkably smooth, true beer flavor. As easy as that, you've got a perfect glass of beer every time. So be sure to take home a handy pack of six bottles or cans of false that. Nationally famous for premium quality. to the top half of the third inning here on Mutual's Game of the Day from Kaminsky Park in Chicago. That's sir, our good friends Dizzy Dean and Gene Kirby both getting a well-deserved rest today. So, um, old Pop Squeeze and I sitting right here at Kaminsky Park in Chicago beating our gums together and talking about this one. All right, uh, you're sort of a sight for sore eyes, but I haven't seen you for quite some time. Still here, Al. Yeah, I see you are, boy. You're always uh, welcome in front of this microphone, too, and that you know. Still getting sappy, sassy. Yeah, I don't know about that fat. You don't know, you're about the same as you did in 1950, but you're sassy. You're twice as sassy as you used to be. <laughs> Ready to go here now in the third inning. First line up is Dick Cocas, hitting left handed. Ready for the first pitch now by Rogovin. Here it comes, a slow curveball, and Coker swings and doesn't get. Ooh, did he go for that one? He certainly was looking at that right field wall again. Strike on the count on Dick Cookett. Rogovin's curve ball is over and good for a called strike. No balls and two strikes. Our field is standing around the right and playing deep for Cookett. He can poke him. Now the 0-2 delivery by Saul Rogovin. And it rides fastball way inside now. Almost got Cookett. Right on the short route. He just drives out to the right to keep him being flunked for that one. Cocos is not a little guy. He's a pretty plump, rotund fellow himself. All right, stepping back up to the plate. Stands about only 5'8 and weighs about 180 pounds, so you have uh, an idea about how round this fellow is. One ball, two strike count on him. Rogovin fast pitch is swung on. There's a line drive hit into right field. Sam Mealy is over to the right, under it, and makes the catch for the line drive for out number one. Line to right field. Roy Severs, who tapped weakly back to the mound in the first inning, becomes the batsman now for St. Louis. Roy Severs at game time was hitting at 232. Pretty good sized guy. Hits him right handed. As soon as uh, we find out what happens here with Roy Severs, we'll be pausing for station identification, so stand by, fellas. First pitch is swung on. There's a high fly ball hit deep in the center field. Way back goes Rivera, still going back. 100 now and makes the catch. Well, we have two outs here in the top of the third inning, and before Len Hart comes up there, let's pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the mutual broadcasting system. with Don Lenhart, hitting right-handed. Don struck out in the first inning to retire the side. 
Yes, you just tuned in with us. It's a two-to-one ball game in favor of the Browns over the Chicago White Sox. Two down, nobody on top of the third. Rather than pitching to Don Lenhart. He does. Lenhart swings and doesn't get it. That's like one. Rutherford coming in up fast with a curveball off the hand. Big right-hand hitter. Just a little farther back from the plate now. Randy spikes in good. And then turns around and says to Charlie Berry, will you take a look at that ball, buddy? So, Charlie Berry, the plate umpire, asks Rutherford to give it up. He looks at it. Fires it right back out to the mound. Says to Lenhart, it's all right. Rutherford's ready. Delivers. Over the blow. And the count is one ball and one strike. Rutherford's ready again. Wasting no time on his pitch. Fires away. Low. Under the knees. Four balls, two. Two balls and one strike. First half of the third inning. Making pencil. He's all squared away and ready. He'll be pouring fourth, fifth, and sixth in the fourth, fifth, and sixth. That ball swung on. He's right back past the mound. Right out into center field for a base hit. Don Lenhart singles right up the backbone of the diamond. That'll be hit number four off Rogovin. Two outs, one on here in the top of the third, and Clint Courtney becomes the batsman. The little bulldog who does the catching for the Browns. Second inning, spiked the ball well, but hit a grounder where Ferris Spain could handle it deep behind first base, and Rogovin covered in time to take the toss for the putout. Now we have two outs and one on here in the top of the third inning. The Boston won a New York nothing. At the end of one inning in the American League, one to nothing, the Red Sox over the Yankees. First pitch to Clint Courtney is inside for ball one. At the end of three innings, one to nothing, Boston over New York. I think I said at the end of one, didn't I, all right? That's right. It's end of three, though, huh? End of three, one to nothing in favor of Boston over the Yankees. Next pitch to play to Courtney is a fastball low. Down on the little fella is two balls and no strike. Rutherford gets ready, looks over at Ferris Bain at first base, checks his runner. Don Lenhart with two away, delivers. Courtney swings there as a well hit ball in the right field. Sam Mealy scoots off to his left under it and makes the catch for out number three. ball, and Sam Mealy had it played just right. No runs. One base hit here in the third inning for the Browns. There were no errors for the White Sox. One Brownie left on. That means they've stranded three. Now I'm going to bat three times. And the score at the end of the first half of the third inning. The Browns two. The Chicago White Sox one. For the last half of inning number three, we're going to have Saul Rogovin, who is a pretty fair hitting pitcher. He'll be followed by the leadoff batsman, Nelson Clark, and then Ferris Payne. Courtney will make the last out here in the third inning, back putting on the protector, getting ready. Get set for the last half of inning number three. Courtney has the tools on, has gotten back up there. Dick Littlefield throwing a few warm up pitches down. And we're moving into the last half of the third inning with Rogovin, Fox, and Fain in that order for the White Sox. Well, the sun's come out again, and it means it'll get even hotter here in Chicago now. The only redeeming feature of this entire city is that it's windy. On a hot summer day, you usually get uh, quite a wind in off the lake, and we've been getting it so far today. And that's the only thing that's uh, kept the town, and particularly the press section here at Comiskey Park, from feeling like a bake oven. We'll run into these good hot days. By George, we like it better than that snow that covers the fields and the ground during the wintertime. Now hitting right-handed, Saul Rogovin. Littlefield's first offering is a curve through their first strike. Comes right back with a fastball and misses with it low inside across the shins to Rogovin. Stalls count, one ball, one strike. Last half, inning number three. 
Mutual game of the day from Kaminsky Park in Chicago. Littlefield's fastball is into the dirt. Courtney can't hold it. Two balls, one strike to Colin Rutherford. Tomorrow, the mutual crew will be moving into Ebbett Field. Tomorrow, I'll be taking a little time off. Jason and Gene will be with you tomorrow from Ebbett Field. Lisa, I guess you and I better go swimming, buddy. Boy, that beach would be nice, huh? <laughs> I could use it today. The little field gets ready. Kicks high, throws. Way outside for ball three. So the count is three balls and one strike on Saul Rogovin. Opening the last half of the third inning here for the White Sox at Comiskey Park. And they're behind as the Browns lead them two to one. We've had one home run in the game so far. Dick Cook has struck a home run in the first inning with the base is empty. Pitch the plate to Rogovin. is outside and low for ball four. Well, this is a guy that Littlefield didn't want to lose, and he lost him. That's the first base on balls given up by the St. Louis left-hander. Nelson Fox is to start the second batting go round for Chicago. Deli came up in the first inning, lined one down the right field line up against the wall for two bases. So he has one hit and one try. Little fella choking up on the wood, stands in batter's box deep. Or the hugs up tight against the plate. Beats the meat under the bat down on the rubber of home plate. Wait for Littlefield to fire away. In comes that pitch, and Fox takes it high for ball one right off the shoulder. Bob Elliott. Just come up and selected a bat. That's sort of an optimistic move. There's a curveball thrown to Fox. Over for called strike. Count is one ball and one strike. Well, is behind Fane and Minoso, but still he came out and selected a bat. Guess they must be figuring on doing a little of that go-go stuff they've been talking about around Chicago here. Pitch the plate to Fox is over the tie. His count has moved now to two and one. Two balls, one strike on Nelly Fox. Nobody out, one on here in the bottom of the third. So the time run for the White Sox is on in Saul Rogerman, who was lost. Down comes the pitch. Fox runs up on it and bluffs the bunt. Takes the pitch and the south side for ball three. Three and one. Courtney bluffed the throw down to first and Saul Rogerman came hustling back in there. Saul's a big guy and it takes him a little time to move. Three and one. There's still a danger of a bunt, so at third base... Jimmy Dyke is playing up pretty close. Now the 3-1 pitch. Fastball is thrown all the way behind the head of Nelson Fox. For ball four. That ball almost got away from Prince Courtney. So two walks have jumped up here in the last half of the third inning. Rogerman goes on down to second now as Nelson Fox moves over and takes his station first. That's second base on balls given up by Littlefield and both of them here in the last half of the third inning. So the tying run has been moved to second base on that walk and the lead run has been placed first. And hitting left-handed is Paris Payne who hit a ball well in the first inning but blind where Dick Cocos could get his hands on it. The infield on the left side has pulled up a couple of steps. The outfield panned around slightly to right not playing too deep with the exception of right fielder Dick Cocos. He's back. And the first pitch to play the swung on, but Fain is the line drive down the right field line, and it is just fouled by a couple of feet. That ball was hit right into the corner. Fain leaned into an inside fastball. Littlefield apparently was trying to break it off Ferris Fain's hand. See down in the bullpen for the St. Louis Browns. Got a left-hander up there going. Little Max Lanier. So Littlefield has... Trouble brewing here in the last half of the third inning. It's all of his own making. He's walked two men and has runners at first and second with nobody out in the last of the third. Barry Spain up there trying to collect his first base hit of the afternoon. He's over one. Backing a couple of feet, he had it too. Spiked right into the corner. Cocos didn't have a chance of getting over to get it. Littlefield taking plenty of time here. Moxie's brow with a handkerchief. Looks around, checks his infield and outfield, finds his infield playing up pretty close. 
particular first baseman Roy Stevers is up ahead of Nelson Fox on the first baseline. Second base combination playing deep. They're playing up close at first and third. Pitch the plate is swung on by Fane. Here comes a foul ball back right under our microphone. Go the count on Fane now. There's no balls, two strikes. Last half of the third inning, two base runners on, nobody out. Two to one in favor of the Browns. The White Sox are threatening now. Max O'Neill throws even harder down the St. Louis bullpen. As Littlefield gets ready. Down comes the pitch. Fast ball, swung on and hit foul off to the left of the plate, up into the second tier, out of play. What you got there, out of score, buddy? Yeah, the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, Al, just tied the Giants at the end of six innings, three and three. Boston won, and the Yankees nothing at the end of four. Boy, those uh, New York Yankees have really been slipping and sliding around, all right? What's that, eight straight? Have they lost eight straight, and they uh, seem to be on their way to lose their ninth straight? Yeah, against Merrill Parnell, he's a tough customer. Well, I can just see old Casey squirming and fidgeting, and he can squirm and fidget. He's a master at it. Now the 0-2 pitch. Darth Spain stands in, grips the handle of that bat, chokes up on it. Straightaway stands the pitcher. Saul Roverman steps off at second. Nellie Fox steps away from first. And time is called as Littlefield is taking too much time and Ferris Payne backs away. Three ahead. Drying his hands off. Now moves back in. Gets a good solid grip on that bat. Littlefield's ready. Throws him a curveball. It stays upstairs right under the chin. One ball and two strikes. A count on Ferris Payne. You can probably hear the wind whipping into our microphones here. Start to uh, blow up pretty heavy. Coming right from behind home plate to straightaway center field. That's going to help those fly balls hit out the center field sector. Big little field pump. Delivers. High for ball two. Two balls and two strikes. The tempo of this ball game will probably slow down considerably as the afternoon wears on because it's hot out in that diamond. say that these guys were perspiring profusely would be an understatement. Man, they're drenched already. Stop the 2-2 pitch here on Ferris Spain. Two on, nobody down, last half of the third inning. Down comes the pitch, there goes the runners. The ball is swung on and lined to the shortstop who bubbles the ball, picks up throws to second base for a force out on Nelson Fox who had to hold up on that play. The throw on the first base was not in time and Rogovin moved on into third. Well, that was taking quite a chance. Ferris Payne lined to the shortstop. Hunter, who bubbled the ball and dropped it in that to pick up and throw for the force out at second. Payne is on at first. Fox forced out at second base on the play. From the shortstop to the second baseman, Bob Young covering. And on the force out, Rogerman moves over to third. Well, that was more good luck than good management. Minimanoso up now. There'll be no error on that. They got the one in the middle. Minimino, 0 for 1 this afternoon. 307 hitter at game time. First pitch to him is low for ball one. Infield playing their usual positions as Minoso swings and throws one into center field for a base hit. Rogerman comes in. There goes Minoso on his way to second. The ball still rolling back to the wall. Coming on around as Ferris Bain. He's going to try to score. It's a stand up linebacker for Minimino. Puts the White Sox ahead here in the last half of the third inning by a 3-2 score. As he drives in two. That gives him 41 runs batted in this year. And off little field, hit number three, runs two and three. So the complexion of this one has changed almost in the twinkling of an eye. And Marty Marion comes out and says, bring me on Max Lanier. Well, that's going to be all for little field. As Max Lanier will relieve him right now. L-A-N-I-E-R, Max Lanier, formerly with the St. Louis Cardinals, the New York Giants, and waved out of the league, and now over here with the St. Louis Browns. So Max Lanier will come on to pitch here to Bob Elliott, the third baseman, in the last half of the third inning. So the Chicago White Sox stayed with it and have moved back into the lead in this ballgame. I should have said 
moved into the lead in this ball game. They have never had it. It's the first time they've had the opportunity of saying we're ahead of the Browns. And Max Lanier comes on. As far as Max Lanier is concerned, we'll see what his record uh, is. We'll look that up for you in just a moment. But let's see. Uh, two and one-third innings has been pitched by Rogan. Check me on this, will you, Art? Two and a third innings, he's given up... Um, oh, I don't mean Rogan, I mean Littlefield. Two and a third innings, he's given up three runs, three hits. Pass two and struck out one. That's right, Al. Well, I almost had Rogan out of that ball game, man. He'd come up here with a ball bat and be getting me, wouldn't he? Sir, he's got the lead now. He wants to keep it. He's uh, going after his fifth win here this afternoon. He's won four and lost nine. So Max Lanier comes on. He'll pitch to Bob Elliott. With Minnie Minoso at third base and one out. Well, as I said, Art, the complexion has changed, though, buddy. Yes, sir, Al, I think that wind's changed a little bit, too. I can uh, get a slight whip of the stockyard. What do you mean a slight whip of the stockyard? Brother, that's a full blast. <laughs> <laughs> Must be doing business over there, sir. That's good news for you. <laughs> it's a bumper crop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this Chicago is a great town, Art. The more you're in it, the... Uh, the more you know about it, one way or another. I'm telling you, you've been in Chicago here all summer long at the biggest end of it, haven't you? Too long. <laughs> if the Chicago Chamber of Commerce is listening, we're only kidding. <laughs> Max Lanier, the little left-hander, has come on here for the St. Louis Browns in the last half of the third inning, which the White Sox have rested the lead from the St. Louis Browns and are now up on top three to two. And they're drinking with their fourth run at uh, third base right now. So and there is on. Max Lanier is throwing the last of his warm-up pitches now, and he's ready to face Bob Elliott. He grounded out in the first inning for Dick Littlefield. This Dick Littlefield won two ball games over the Chicago White Sox and hasn't lost one. But both of the two wins he has over the White Sox, both of those games, he didn't finish either one. So they got him out of here now. He stands to lose this one. Brown is infield now, pulled up tight, Minoso at third, one out here in the last half of the third, and Bob Elliott standing in. Lanier offers him a soft, easy curveball that is under the knees for ball one. Minoso has hammered in two runs to run his total for the year to 41. Wilson has the other run batted in. Max Lanier, chunky left-hander, looks down at Bob Elliott, his former teammate. Former teammate on the Giants, former teammate on the Browns. Throws him a curveball, and Bob takes it. It's over for a call strike. One ball, one strike. Browns and the White Sox. here at Comiskey Park this afternoon on Mutual's Game of the Day. Now we're set to the next pitch from Molinaire. Here it comes, fastball, swung on and hit down a deep shortstop. Up with it is Hunter Fast to first base and Elliot is out as the run comes in to score. So Elliot is out of there. I think unless uh, my old eyes deceive me that uh, third baseman Jim Dyke had the tip end of his glove on that drive, deep short stop. He dived out there, so we're going to have to say it's a five to six to three foot out, I think. But put out it was. Yeah, so we just had verification on the public address system here in the first section. So they're out there now. Swings on the first pitch, and there's a line drive. Hit past Johnny Gross into center field. Look at that for He's on his way to second. Turns to the left to second. He's moving over to third base now. It's a stand-up three-bagger for Jim Rivera. Well, that hit will come off by Max Manier. Four to two in favor of the Chicago White Sox. Rivera just spiked that ball and spiked it well. Coming up to the plate now is Sam Mamie. Going 
get out there. We're going to go out there and pick up a few of those bricks and stones out to wake these papers down. I tell you, it's really blowing up a gale here, isn't it? <laughs> I might have had one of those Texas Longhorn tears a minute. <laughs> Man, I tell you, it really blows down there in Texas, too. He should have been down there yesterday, Art. It was, it was really great. Just enough wind to keep it cool enough to be pleasant. Nice, bright, brilliant sunshine. And when that Cowtown posse came out at that ballpark, look out, boy, that big star of Texas flag. You should have seen old Diz right in the saddle there. He was hooping it up with a vigilante. <laughs> I think we had all the humidity up here in Chicago. <laughs> well, you might have had all the humidity up here in Chicago, but not, not quite all of it. It was a little bit warm. Now, let's see. Rivera on third base. And over at first... The first baseman, Roy Stevers, is called for the ball and goes over and steps on first base and appeals to the first base umpire, Stevens, that Rivera did not touch going by first base. And it's going to be allowed. It's going to be allowed. The appeal play is going to be allowed. It took them a long time to do it, but they just this minute did it. Well, there's one for you. So that'll be out. Number three on an appeal play. I don't think I've seen an appeal play uh, executed that long after uh, all had been stopped. An appeal play. Jim Rivera did not touch first base, and the umpire, Stevens, allows the appeal. So that's all here in the third inning. So three runs come in here for the Chicago White Sox on two base hits. There were no errors. And nobody was left on. So those things, I guess you got to watch out for pretty closely. Well, before we get into the fourth inning, we'd like once again to remind all of our good friends around the country that baseball at its best is being played this year in the minor league. So uh, we sincerely hope that you're getting out to see um, every uh, ball game you possibly can. Well, right here at the end of three innings of play, the score stands the White Sox four and the St. Louis Browns two. Well, isn't it good to be able to relax occasionally with no cares, no hurry, nothing to do but sit back and listen to the ball game? Well, that's just one more detail to complete that picture of solid entertainment and contentment. What is it? Why, a cold bottle or can of false staff premium quality beer. Always keep it handy in the icebox, and then when you take it easy... And it's true beer refreshment you want. It's yours, just by filling your glass with frosty cold Falstaff beer. Nationally famous for premium quality. Now we're ready for the fourth inning, with Jimmy Dyke coming up to the plate as the first batsman in the fourth inning. So, uh, let's turn uh, Pop Gleason loose on four, five, and six. You all ready, Pop? Right, Al. Jimmy Dyke bats him right hand as he's been up once, bounced out to the shortstop. Rawls have been ready. Delivers his first pitch, and there's a pop-up going out to short center field. Going back under it, getting under it is Nellie Fox, and that's it for the out. So here in the top of the fourth inning, with the Chicago White Sox leading the St. Louis Browns 4-2, to two, Jimmy Dyke gets the first ball pitch for a pop-up to Nellie Fox. And it brings up the left-handed batting Bob Young, who's batting at 264, double to center field and scores. The pitch to Young is up high for ball one. Bob Young bats the left-handed, takes up high for ball one. The announcement just came from the official score that time had been called. And the appeal play could not be made until time had been called back in. A called strike on Bobby Young. As the curveball by Rogerman picks up the inside corner, and the count goes to one and one. They could not make the play at first until time had been uh, put back in by the umpire, and that was the cause of the delay on the appeal play. A let up pitches up high for ball two. Two and one. The Brownies batting. Top of the fourth inning is the trail of White Sox by two runs. It's Chicago four, St. Louis two. One away here in the top of the fourth. And the count, two balls, one strike on Bobby Young. Rogovin delivers. A fastball is high for ball three. Three and one, the count on Bobby Young. In case you joined us a little bit late, defensively, the White Sox have Minnie Minosa in left, Jim Rivera in center, and Sam Mealy in right. 
The big right-hander, Paul Rockman, delivers. And it's low outside for ball four. And Bob Young gets the base on ball. That's the second walk given up by Rogelman. He walked uh, under intentionally back in the second inning. You're in field for the White Sox. Bob Elliott at third. Freddie Marsh playing in the absence of the injured Carousel at shortstop. The hustling Nelly Fox at second. The battling Ferris Payne at first. Red Wilson behind the plate. And the big six foot two right-hander, weighing 205 pounds, Paul Rogerman on the mound. And he's getting ready to pitch now to Bill Hunter. Hunter bats him right-handed, swings and sends a looping fly ball up toward right field. There's Nelly Fox back on the edge of the grass, and Neely comes in, and Neely makes the catch. So Bill Hunter lifts the soft pop fly to short right field, taken by Sam Neely. And there are two men out here in the top of the fourth inning. And it brings to bat now Max Lanier, who went in to replace Dick Littlefield. And Max Lanier, although he pitches left-handed, bats him from the right side. Lanier standing deep in the batter's box, well up toward the plate, up on the handle of the bat a couple of inches. And we have a runner on here in the top of the fourth with two men out. The pitch to Lanier is a curve that breaks outside. Ball one. Rivera, of course, lost the hit on the appeal play as he was out at first base. Had the appeal been made at second, of course, he would have got credit for a single. But a swing and a miss by Max Lanier, and the count is even at 1-1. Jim Rivera is playing Lanier straight away, and the infield is set up straight away for Lanier. Now Rogerman into his stretch, checks his runner, delivers to Lanier, out, call strike over the outside corner, and it's one ball, two strikes. Charlie Berry calling the balls and strikes, Johnny Stevens at first, Jim Duffy calling the plays at second, and the veteran Bill Summers over third. Four to two, the score in favor of Chicago. The pitch is swung on and fouled off the end of the bat, and the count remains one and two. In case you join us a little bit late, at the end of the first inning, the Cleveland Indians lead Detroit two to nothing. At the end of five innings, Boston leads the Yankees one nothing. At the end of seven innings, it's tied up Pittsburgh three to Giants three. And at the end of the first inning, Milwaukee two, Cincinnati nothing. Everything else in the majors is going tonight. Here's the one-two delivery, and it's swung on a ground ball hit out to shortstop. Up of the ball is Freddie Marsh, puts the force on Bob Young as he tosses to Nelly Fox, and the side is retired. Max Lanier rounds into a fourth play. Freddie Marsh to Nelly Fox for the force on Bob Young to retire the side. And for the St. Louis Browns in the top half of the fourth inning, there were no runs, no hits, no errors. One man was left on. And at the end of the first half of the fourth inning, the score remains the Chicago White Sox four and the St. Louis Browns two. And out without a doubt, and that requires a sign. But according to the catcher, here's what the umpire cries. I'm out, balls! Smooth and golden, mellow fruit, that real enjoyment through and through. Hate it once and once you do, you'll sing out the ball staff, sing out the ball staff, sing out the ball staff, Moving now into the top half of the seventh inning as the storm and up two up here for the Chicago White Sox. Scoring seven runs. The storm brewing up behind us in a lot of dark clouds. And we've got a storm brewing up for you right now as we call on Brother Al Hopper to come back in here and take over. Man, I don't know what kind of a storm it's going to be for, but we really need to have something right here. Hey, sir, those Sox have had 11 base hits. Those are their 11 runs. Seven runs. 
We're ready here in the top half of the seventh inning with Johnny Gross coming up now. And Doris is ready to make the first pitch for him. He does. This was a curveball through there for a strike. The new catcher for the White Sox is Sherman Lawler. And Stevens, Vern Stevens, has gone to shortstop. Let's put the swung on by Gross. There's a high foul ball hit off to the left of the plate. Lawler coming over, getting under, takes the catch for out number one. So Sherman Lawler is batting in the number seven position. Sherman Lawler doing the White Sox catching here in the seventh inning. Stevens is at shortstop. That's Vern Stevens. Cocus with one hit and three tries. Joyce fires fastball with left handed batting Cocus and misses with it outside for ball one. Three runs on seven hits for St. Louis. Has committed no errors. Has granted six men on so far. Cocus swings on the next pitch. It's a high fly ball out into left field. Minoso coming on for it. Makes the catch for out number two. So we have two up and two down here in the top of seven inning, and that brings on Roy Seaver, the first baseman. So the White Sox defensively now have Harry Dorish on the mound behind the plate, Sherman Lawler. Bain is at first, Fox at second, Vern Stevens at short, Bob Elliott at third. The outfield remains the same. First pitch to right-hand hitting Roy Stevers is swung on a miss for strike one. All of these, all of these runs are going to help the cause of starting pitcher Saul Rogerman. There's a fastball swung on and a high pop-up. The result out in very short right center field. Going back forward is Nelson Fox, the second baseman. 100 and takes it for out number three. Well, there was no trouble in the top of the seventh inning for Harry Doyle. He mowed the Browns down in order. And the score at the end of six and a half innings of play is the Browns three and the White Sox 11. Chicago, the wind blowing in off the lake, blowing at a terrific clip. And we may have rain as it is being preceded now by thunder. The wind is whipping up down uh, behind center field and uh, bringing up the dust off the diamond. So here we go in the last half of the seventh inning. First man up will be Sherman Lawler, the right hand hitting catcher, relief catcher. Out of the mound is Gobo Holloman, makes the first pitch, cross fire, that misses low and outside for ball one. We've got a dust storm going on right here now. That usually precedes the rain. Curveball thrown by Holloman is in off the hip for ball one. Another ball two. Two balls and no strike. As soon as we find out what happens with Sherman Lawler, we'll uh, have a quick pause for identification. Lawler watches the fastball slide off outside for ball three. Three balls and no strike. Getting gray, it's getting very dark here in Chicago now. The wind is blowing very stiffly from behind center field. Pitch the plate to Sherman Lawler is a fastball over for call strike one. Three balls and one strike is the count on Sherman Lawler. Holloman 
Next pitch is swung on by Lawler. There's a high, tremendously high fly ball into right center field. Getting under the zip coke the right fielder. And uh, makes the catch for out number one. That'll bring up Bernie Stevens. Before he comes up there, let's pause in seconds for station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Now for the Chicago White Sox with one out, nobody on in the last half of the seventh inning. Bone Stevens. He's been used in a uh, utility role here for the White Sox. Swings on the pitch and doesn't get it. Double Holloman rears back, fires again. Stevens backs off, takes the curve on the corner for a called strike. Holloman ready again. Wasting no time. Delivery. Strike three swinging. So that's all for Bone Stevens. Goes quickly out of there, and Holloman hangs up his first strike out the afternoon. Coming on now is Harry Dory, the White Sox relief pitcher. He came on, if you recall, in the sixth inning. Came on to pitch to Hunter. So he pitched two thirds of the sixth inning. First pitch is swung on by Dory, says the line drive hit into left field. It's in there for a base hit. So Dory is on. Down, Dory's down with a rifle shot in the left. That off um, Holloman is hit number two. That's hit number 12, all told. For Chicago. Still continues to be dark and threatening here, but so far we haven't had any rain. That request has been kicked up and swirling around over the field. Makes it look sort of uh, brownishly hazy. Batsman is Nelson Fox. Second baseman starting the first batting go round for Chicago. He's been up there three times officially and has had three doubles. Makes the first pitch across the shins on the inside for ball one. Joyce, the base runner at first for the White Sox here in the last half of seventh inning. 11 to 3 in favor of Chicago over the St. Louis Browns. Holloman's fastball is inside off the belt buckle. Ball two to Manny Fox. 11 runs on 12 hits for Chicago. Three runs on seven hits for the Browns. In comes the next pitch, fastball. Low on, on the inside. Three balls, no strike. That's the Alan Blamo Pop. Six runs in the sixth inning. He really had a merry-go-round working, didn't he? Real delivery, outside for ball four. So, Nelson Fox throws his stick away, moves off the first base, and Harry Doris walks down second. Off Holloman, that's based on balls number one. That's the fifth based on balls to be picked up this afternoon by the White Sox off the pitching of the St. Louis Browns. Littlefield, Lanier, Stewart, Giska, and now Holloman. Batting left out of the spare thing. Burhead's gone 0 for 2 this afternoon. He sacrificed once and walked once. He's up there for the fifth time swinging that lumber. Two down, two down, two down, two on, last half of the seventh inning. There's just thunder rattling around here in these Chicago skies. Looks as though it's raining outside the ballpark, but so far we haven't had any in here. Last pitch to the plate is up above the letters. On the count to their thing. Gentleman ready, delivers one and all, fast ball over to knees. Down is one ball and one strike. On pain. Eleven runs have been batted in here by the White Sox this afternoon. Minnie Minoso has five of them. He's having himself quite a day. Curveball. Looks like a screwball breaking outside to a left-hand hitter. Ball two. Two balls and one strike to count on Ferris Payne. One is the first and second. Two down, last of the seven. Holloman's given up two hits so far. No run. Payne swings on the next pitch. Dumps it down along the left field line. It's in there for a base hit. 
Here comes Corey turning around third. He's coming in to score. There's the pick up. Nelson Parks is going to try to score. The throw comes in. Not in time. And Parks scores also. Wilfrain drops one down the left field line. We're batting a pair. That's just the Chicago total up to 13. Waste no time. He was tearing around at third base. Harry Joy easily scored from second. Pete Bagger hit into the field right down the line. And here comes the rain. Brother, it's really coming. And the plate umpire, Charlie Berry, says, Wait a minute, boys. Let's hold this one up. Let's hold this one up and see what's going to happen. So the rain came right after first pain double. Being held up right now. Let's see uh, how long it's going to be held up. But it's all entirely up to the umpire. Right now, it's 13 runs on 13 base hits for the White Sox. And for the St. Louis Brownies, three runs on seven base hits. Neither side has been charged with an error here this afternoon. Six men have been left on so far by the Browns and going to bat seven times. And four men have been left on by the Chicago White Sox. It means simply that uh, they have been moving them off the bases and the Browns haven't. So the ball game is going to be held up for a little while. Do we see whether or not it's going to rain hard enough to uh, stop this one completely? Actually, right now the rain is flacking off so we can hardly see it. So it's came down in one of those April showers coming here on the first day of July in the Windy City. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we might get this one started right back again. Up here comes Charlie Berry out as fun as that was just a little flush of a shower. Let's uh, get back at it, huh? Well, we're very thankful that uh, we're continuing here because after all, got a plane to catch to New York tonight. And while uh, the canvas is being taken off, home plate and pitcher's mind, got a couple of wives we'd like to acknowledge. One from Childers, or is it Childers, Texas? From Mel Carter asking this question, on an appeal play, is the hit allowed? Well, it all depends. In the case of the Kim Rivera this time, it was not allowed because he didn't touch first base. Memphis, Tennessee sends a wire, and uh, an old friend of ours, the two trumpet in the band. We call him Cousin Jimmy. <laughs> Cousin wants to know which... Uh, of the two of us have a tougher one-nighter. He playing with a band or me on the baseball stick? I don't know. I guess it's a little cross up of both. The Hot Springs, Arkansas, a very fine wife of Eddie Honick, to tell us that tomorrow is going to be Hal Martin night in Hot Springs, and the fans are presenting him with a set of golf clubs. Hal is the leading home run hitter of the Cotton State League with 28. We've set it right up to the minute. I want to wish you all the good luck in the world and hope the fans get out and have a look at what's going to go on. Also from Sydney, Montana, Ray Whiting tells us that Roger Blodgett, 16-year-old, but I pitched a no-hit-no-run game as Sydney, Montana Junior Legion team defeated Minot, North Dakota Junior Legion 3 to nothing on the 25th. Struck out 13 batters and has won two and lost one. And the folks out there listen to the game of the day over KGCX in Sydney. Wish them all the luck in the world out there, too, and hope they're with us every day when the game of the day is sent their way. Well, now, we start back at the business here at White Sox Park. Minnie Minoso is the batter. Down comes the pitch to Minoso, and he after it and doesn't get it. Strike one. Thunder still rattling through the skies overhead. Minoso swings on the next pitch and doesn't get it. Holdeman Scott with him as no balls to strike. Bain leads off second. In comes the pitch swung on. There is a looping fly ball hit into right field. Focus comes up to it and grabs it for out number three. So that's all here in the seventh inning. Start the White Sox pick up a pair. Two runs on two base hits. Well, no errors and one man was left off. And before we go to the top half of the eighth inning, I'd like to once again remind all of you folks about uh, your minor league ball club. And by the way, speaking of the minor leagues, half of the eight farm clubs of the White Sox are in first place today following last night's action. Our Memphis are tied with Nashville, Colorado Springs, Waterloo, and Madisonville. Well, 
Charles, we really hope that all you folks are going to get out and cheer those boys and keep them right up in the top spot in their league. They've had some good pitching and some heavy hitting. Well, right here we've had some uh, heavy pitching, heavy hitting, vice versa. And the score at the end of seven innings to play is the White Sox, 13, and the St. Louis Browns, 3. Got a chore to do around the house that you've been putting off. Well, here's how to get the job done. Promise yourself a reward for doing it well. Like a good cold bottle of can of false staff beer. You'll treat yourself to the finest, the premium quality in false staff, guaranteed right on its gold and white premium label. Yes, sir, false staff is always the choicest product of the brewer's art. Tell you what I'd like you to do, just taste premium quality false staff, and then you'll see what I mean. start to get ready here for the eighth inning. Lo and behold, the rain's come down again, and Charlie Perry says, boys, we're going to have to hold it up for another few minutes. But at least we've got seven full complete innings in, and we have a 13-3 to ball game in favor of the Chicago White Sox. They have 13 runs on 13 hits, no errors. And so far in the game, they have left five men aboard. And for the St. Louis Browns, three runs on seven base hits. They've committed no errors, and they have stranded six. So the rains are coming down here once again, and it looks as though uh, we may not be able to resume this one, as uh, the rains are driving down in pretty good fashion. However, it's 13 to 3 in favor of the White Sox, and it will go in the books as such if we never get another pitch here at Comiskey Park this afternoon. While we're waiting to see whether or not this ball game is going to be continued, I think uh, Art Gleason might be able to bring us up on the score. He's been over checking with the Western Union ticker. So, uh, Art, if you will, please, while we watch the raindrops swirl here at Kimmisky Park. Well, Alice, the door, I can hardly read them. Well, I'll turn on the light for you, buddy. Anybody got a flashlight? In the American League, however, the Boston Red Sox handed the New York Yankees their ninth great loss this afternoon at Fenway Park in Boston. As they shut out the Yankees, 4 to nothing. Mel Parnell pitching a four-hit shutout. After in the five and a half innings, Detroit leads the Cleveland Indians three to two. Pitching for the Tigers, and Bob Lemon pitching for Cleveland. Sounded like you just hit a couple out there to right field that Sunday. Yeah, buddy, I got news for you. Listen to that one. I got news for you. If they're going to keep this up, I'm going to take the choo-choo train to New York. <laughs> Get out of here with that lightning club much closer. Right, one of those lightning flashes right back to the city, can I? Well, we'll continue with the scores. Detroit leads Cleveland 3-2 at the end of five and a half. Al Rosen hit his 18th homer in the first with one on. Washington and Philadelphia are playing tonight. In the National League, in 11 innings, the Pittsburgh Pirates defeated the New York Giants 5-3. to three. Listen to that thunder. For the Pittsburgh Pirates, five runs, eight hits, no errors, and for New York, three runs, eight hits, and three errors. Pepsi, who came on to relieve in the tenth inning for the Pirates, is the winner. And Wilhelm, who came on to relieve in the seventh inning for New York, was the loser. Again, at the end of the six and a half innings, Milwaukee leads the Cincinnati Reds nine to two. Home runs uh, for Milwaukee. Sid Gordon and Eddie Matthews, and for Cincinnati, Greengrass. Philadelphia and Brooklyn are playing tonight, and the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals are playing tonight. And if the weather is anything uh, like it is right here in Chicago at the moment down in St. Louis, way, Al, they might get rained out. It's really coming down, huh? Yeah, this is one of the hardest rains out I've seen in quite some time. The ground crew was trying to get the infield covered, but I doubt seriously if they were going to get the second half of the infield covered before the water soaks it completely. Of course, uh, they've been needing a lot of rain through the Midwest anyway, and uh, the ground here at Comiskey Park in Chicago drains pretty easily anyway, and between the fact that it's dry and the drains being pretty good, I'd be able to keep the infield from getting too soaked, and the rest of the ball game will be able to play. 
However, the St. Louis Browns are behind here, 13 to 3, and they have two innings and want to do something about it. While the White Sox don't seem to mind, uh, they wouldn't care if this ball game would be called immediately now because it would mean that they would have picked up another game. But as far as the American League is concerned, the New York Yankees, as I told you a few minutes ago, have just, have just lost their ninth ball game in a row. And for them, it must be some sort of record. I haven't, and I don't think Art has, the actual record of how many they, as a ball club, have lost in a row. You might find it in the Red Book there, Art, if you'd like to take a look. Well, I remember, Al, that uh, during Casey's uh, four years as manager of the Yankees, last year they lost five in a row. It was the longest losing streak they had under Stengel. Uh, I, uh, as I recall, while they were having that uh, losing streak, uh, it goes way back into the 20s that the Yankees have lost that many. I'll try and see if I can find it in that red book. Yeah, I think maybe the American League red book might give you that the longest losing streak for the New York Yankees, but nine certainly is, if not top, the very close to top for the New York Yankees. Nine in a row as this afternoon, the Boston Red Sox behind Mel Parnell, as uh, our soldiers shut out the New York Yankees on a 4 0 count. There have been several other things, too, that have broken as far as news is concerned. See where the New York Yankees have uh, asked for waivers on Ewell Blackwell. And although Blackwell is a 10-year man, and I should say and Blackwell is a 10-year man, so he cannot be sent back to the minors unless he says yes, he will go. And the Yankees would like to send him back to the minors, back to Kansas City to try to work out a bad arm. However, it all depends on what Blackie wants to do. And also, the A's have gotten Carmen Morrow uh, and have sent Thomas to the Senators all on waivers. So they traded outfielders in a deal that sent uh, Keith Thomas to the Senators and Carmen Morrow to Philadelphia. Morrow, by the way, was hitting uh, 327 for Montreal last year. He was formerly with the Chicago Cubs. He's the same guy who was very fast but was unable to hit major league pitching in the National League. We've been talking quite a bit about the National League All-Stars, too, and the American League All-Stars. Of course, uh, Mutual Carry, the All-Star game on the 14th of July, out of the city of Cincinnati, as one of its many exclusive sports features. And uh, of course, all the folks around the nation have been balloting on their Major League Stars to get them uh, places in the All-Star game, and we're very thankful that many of our listeners on the Mutual game of the day have added their ballot. If you've been rolling in and see that Ted Kruzewski in the National League for first baseman has almost a half million votes. There's 491,804 as of this morning. Hodges of Brooklyn is second with 472,916. The second base position in the National League is being led by Red Shandy with 503,421. Ryan of Philadelphia is second with Williams of New York third. As far as the third baseman are concerned, the young sophomore Eddie Matthews of Milwaukee leads with 498,628. And at shortstop, Pee Wee Reese leads Granny Hamler by 12,000 votes. Reese has 482,982 and Hamler 470,615. For the left field position, Stan Musial has moved into the lead again over Ralph Tanner. Dan Musial, 497,272, as to Ralph Tanner's 483,166. In center field, Richie Ashburn of Philadelphia leads by a slight margin over Duke Snyder of Brooklyn. Ashburn has 486,201, and Snyder leads for the center field post. Snyder's in second place with 477,595. For right field, Hank Sauer of Chicago has drawn 478,356 to lead over Enos Slaughter of St. Louis, who has 461,773. For the catchers, Campanella of Brooklyn is leading over Crandall and Wright. For Campanella, 492,182, and for Crandall of Milwaukee, 448,616. Now that's your National League leading in the poll for the All-Star Game. Yeah, the rain is still coming down here and coming down hard, so we're going to have to still hold this ball game up a while to see whether or not they're going to be able to get it in. Now over in the American League, at first base, leading in the way of uh, first base votes, is Mickey Brennan of Washington. He has 521,647. At the 
second base position, Billy Goodman of Boston, leading with 469,358 over Nelson Frost of Chicago in second place. Avila Cleveland is third. For the third base position on the American League All Star team, right up to now, it's Rosen of Cleveland with uh, 474,229. Shooter of Philadelphia, surprisingly enough, is in second place, 431,813. Then comes Stella of Boston with 428,155. For the shortstop position, still the little scooter leads everybody in the American League. He has 472,306. Harris Scott of Chicago is second with 464,000. And then it drops way down to the team of Detroit for 273,000. So it looks as though it will be a fight between Rizzuto and Carousel for the starting position on the American League All-Star team. In left field, Gus Gurniel of uh, Philadelphia is leading with 483,511. Minoso of Chicago second with 442,704. For the center field position, Mickey Mantle of the New York Yankees leads with 529,887. And then Busby of Washington is in second with 335,000. So Mickey Mantle has quite a lead for the center field spot in the American League All-Star Poll. In right field, Hank Bauer of the New York Yankees leads with 481,548. And almost 100,000 behind him is Newman of Detroit with 376. 224, then comes Neely of Chicago. The catcher, Yogi Berra, out in front over White of Boston. Berra of the Yankees, 494,649, while White of Boston has 372,114. We thought we'd bring you up to date while we had a few minutes time here, waiting to see whether or not the rain would abate. It's been going in the All-Star Poll, and we're very grateful to all of our listeners across the nation who have taken uh, pencil in hand and written out their starting on So our poll is closed now, and we're waiting for the final tabulations on just who the men will be playing in the All-Star game this year. As far as the standings of these two ball clubs are concerned, these two leagues are concerned, in the National League, Brooklyn is still out in front by one half game over the Milwaukee ball club. But that's on the losing side. Both teams have won a total of 42 games. Brooklyn has lost 26, and Milwaukee has lost 27. So there are only nine percentage points separating Brooklyn and Milwaukee in the National League. And that's going to make for an even tighter race, as St. Louis in third place is only two and one-half games off the pace. They've won 40 and lost 29. Philadelphia comes in in fourth place then, three games off the pace, with a 37-27 affair for a percentage of 578. And then comes the fifth-place New York Giants, they're seven and a half games behind, followed by Cincinnati in sixth place, 12 games behind. The Chicago Cubs in seventh, they're 18 games behind. And Pittsburgh bringing up the rear with 20 and one half games behind. In the American League, the New York Yankees, who slid down another one here this afternoon, and Cleveland, who has their ball game to go yet. They're five games behind right now. The New York Yankees having lost their ball game to Boston find themselves only four and a half games out in front and should Cleveland win the ball game then Cleveland who right now are behind Detroit four to two at the end of seven innings if Cleveland should pick up and win that one they'll find themselves only four games behind Chicago is in third place and the White Sox are six and a half games off the pace and if they should win this one today New York having lost theirs they'll go to five and a half games behind while the Boston Red Sox who tagged the New York Yankees have picked up an entire game on the New York Yankees and are only now nine and a half games behind in fourth place in the American League. Washington follows them in number five position, 13 games behind. Philadelphia in six are 16 games behind. And St. Louis in seventh, 22 games behind. Detroit in eighth are 27 games off the pace. Well, that's about how everything starts up in baseball as far as the All-Star Bowl is concerned and as far as the standings in the Major League Clubs are concerned. That uh, brings us up to the minute on the information we've been able to uh, secure around the circuit. And as far as this ball game here is concerned, it was uh, held up at the end of uh, seven full innings of play with the White Sox leading the score, the White Sox 13, and the Browns 3.
back here at Comiskey Park in Chicago. The rains have let up considerably and we're waiting to see whether or not the umpires are going to have the boys back out there on the playing field. They were able, that is the groundkeepers were able to get one half of the infield covered and uh, weren't able to get the other half covered. So around first base and the second base position we find considerable water and a lot of uh, puddles. But pitchers mound and home plate Really covered, and the folks are all sitting around here waiting now to see whether or not this ball game is going to continue. So, if it should, of course, we'll stay right with you. If not, well, it'll have to be called today at the end of seven innings with the White Sox winning the ball game 13 to 3. But that's uh, all in the lap of the guards, and also the man upstairs who turns on the ticket and sends down the rain. So we'll continue to sit along here and wait. And inasmuch as it's come time for network and station identification, suppose we pull switches along the network, fellas. All set? Here we go. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Here to Comiskey Park in Chicago now, and we were saying a few minutes ago that nine losses by the New York Yankees must for them set some sort of a record. Well, we've been looking through the books and we haven't been able to find any tabulation of it, but uh, Art Gleason is still looking through the books and he's been looking for the longest losing streak in the American and National League, and I think he's come up with it. So, uh, Art, how about you coming on in here and telling the folks about uh, what you found out? Well, I'll hear a long way from the uh most consecutive games lost. Uh, the record is 26, which is uh, set by Louisville on May the 22nd of 1889. Then in uh, 1899, Cleveland, who at that time was in the National League, they lost 24 in a row. And the modern record, of course, is uh, 20 games lost by Boston in the American League in 1906. Philadelphia uh, in the American League, July 21st. To August the 8th of 1916, and Philadelphia again lost 20, August the 7th, August the 24th, at 1943. So the Yankees, we don't have just how many they lost, but I believe, Al, it was during the year of 1925 under Miller Huggins when they finished in seventh place that they uh, had their greatest loss of consecutive games, but just what the number is, I don't recall. I do recall. Uh, Back in 1950, though, we had a lot of weather just like we're having here at Comiskey Park today down at Griffith uh, Stadium in Washington. Do you remember those days? Oh, yeah, I remember those very well. I they used to hold up the ball games, and we'd look up this time and say, well, let's see, will it get over or won't it get over? Then we'd take a look at the clock and say, well, we might as well cancel out on yonder airplane because I don't think we're going to make it. And uh, just about the same situation has happened here this afternoon. Art. Although the rain has let up considerably, it's still coming down here. I decide, I, well, I, I doubt very much if they'll decide to go ahead and continue this. When that infield on the right side is pretty well uh, caked with mud now, and we have some patches of water down there. But it all depends on what the groundskeepers are going to be able to do here. If they can possibly continue this ball game, they will, because the Browns have of course an opportunity to do something in the ball game despite the fact they have only two innings left to them still uh, I've known ball clubs to uh, make a lot of runs in one inning and by making a lot of runs in one inning they're probably winning a game so after all they've got uh, a total of six outs remaining to them and if this ball game continues they have the opportunity always of coming up and closing the gap picking up the ten runs to tie the game and maybe the one that'll win about and I know uh, you were talking uh, before the game with some of the White Sox officials and uh, some of the information I did give out about the White Sox Farm Club meeting, but I know you have some other information that will interest the fans around the country, particularly those who follow the White Sox and follow the 
Ventures of the White Sox Farm Club. So, Art, uh, how about you give them forth with that information, buddy? Well, uh, coming in here to Comiskey Park, it's always a pleasure indeed to get a hold of John Rigney, the great pitcher of the Chicago White Sox in years gone by, who now has charge of the farm system and kind of bugged along with it on how all those young kids are doing down there in the farm. He's going to his office here at uh, Comiskey Park, and he's got a big blackboard down there. He's got every one of them numbered. I think they have something like 76 in the armed forces at the present time. But I know one fellow that he's very high on, and that's that uh, Bill Wilson who's with him this spring. Uh, Bill got off to a very bad start during spring training with the uh, Chicago White Sox. But they sent him down to Memphis on option, and uh, the big outfielder, since he's joined the Memphis club, has hit 14 home runs and started in 42 runs and is hitting 348 for manager Luke Gatling. Following tonight's game at Hutchinson, the Topeka Isles, the White Sox affiliate in the Western Association, return home to play host to the Joplin in a four-game series. Link Barrett Files are currently in second place. So, uh, how about you fans around Topeka kind of getting up there and help old Link and the Isles get up in the first place? I'd like to see all you fans get out and see as many of the minor league games as you possibly can. Heavy heavy hitting has featured uh, Madisonville Drive to the top spot in the Kitty League. The Miners are at home tonight and tomorrow night with Paducah, providing the opposition also lead the Kitty League in team batting with a mark of 291, which is a very good team average. And the team is fielding for an average of 949. Weeping Willie McPhail's Colorado Springs Sky Sox has just opened a long homestand which will run through July the 9th to find Lincoln, Sioux City, and Omaha invading Colorado Springs. Al, where did they get that name of Weeping Willie McPhail out there at Colorado Springs? Well, I don't know, but I wouldn't call him Weeping Willie McPhail because the next time he saw me, he's obviously coming after me with a ball bat and his own spike. Well, I, I do I think you uh, get that name down in this... Uh, Farm off of here at Kaminsky Park because I think uh, McPhail is always weeping for more help and more ball players. Well, that's probably true. They tag some of the dots on his names on ball players and uh, baseball officials you ever saw in your life. But uh, it's all done in uh, a lot of fun, and I think it's always accepted as such. Well, everybody, you talk about weeping. It's really raining here yet in Chicago, and a lot of the bronze has gone uh, across the diamond out to the chute, which leads to the showers. So if that's any indication, well, it could or could not be. But uh, we'd just like to uh, tell the folks who perhaps have just tuned in with us that uh, this ball game was held up at the end of seven innings of play because of the downpour here in Chicago. And the score at that time was the White Sox 13 and the Browns 3. You know, there's something about a tall, frosted glass of fall staff that always makes a friendly evening at your favorite tavern just a little more enjoyable. And that something is fall staff's genuine premium quality. Guaranteed right on its golden white premium label. Yes, sir, from the first golden clear glass bowl, your smiling bartender pours for you, right down to your last satisfying taste. Fall Staff is brim full of true premium quality flavor and character that no other beer can equal. Sure, Fall Staff is always the choicest product of the brewer's eye. Right back here to Comiskey Park in Chicago with the rain on, having almost stopped. There's a possible chance of uh, playing the rest of the ball game and getting it in. However, oh, it's a 13-3 to ball game right now in favor of the Chicago White Sox as we wait and see what played on part Charlie Ferry and his cohorts are going to do. In the meantime, we have received a wire from Miami, Florida, from C.W. Hicks. Wanting to know where old Ziz is. Wants to know he's in Fort Worth or where he is. Well, as far as I know right now, Dizzy is on his way to New York City, and he'll be with you. He and Gene will be with you all tomorrow from Ebbets Field. I'm very glad to know that the folks down in Miami, Florida, enjoyed the broadcast from Macon and Fort Worth. I'd like to say that both in Macon and Fort Worth, the mutual crew enjoyed themselves tremendously. But the game between the Macon Peaches and the Augusta Rams, providing a very fine ball game for us on Monday in mutual minor league game of the day. And yesterday, with all the football and the... 
yellow atmosphere in Fort Worth. It was a pleasure to be at the park, at the great field, and broadcast the Fort Worth Cats playing the Tulsa Oilers. By the way, in case you didn't hear the announcement from Fort Worth yesterday, on the 24th day of July, Mr. P.W. and Mr. B.J. has arranged with Grail Hollett that the mutual crew will be in Tulsa on the 24th day of July for the broadcast of the Tulsa Oilers and the San Antonio Ball Club, I believe it is. After all, I uh, just heard snatches of the conversation. And if it is not San Antonio, it will be Beaumont, but I believe it's San Antonio. So we'll be down in Texas League again on the 24th day of July to visit with our friends in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, well, I'll be looking for it. I know personally going down there. I haven't been in Tulsa for about 15 years. And they tell me the place is uh, even better than it used to be, and heaven knows it was a fine place then. But we get a tremendous kick out of going to the various towns in which our broadcasts are heard and meeting all the press. And we sincerely hope that on the 24th of July we can see and meet lots of folks in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had a great time with Jim Humphreys and Bob Murphy and the crew down at uh, Oklahoma City when we were in there for that ball game just a couple of days back. And we'll be looking forward to visiting down in Tulsa. Of course, we'll have uh, other minor league ball games throughout the course of the season for you because we found that there has been an interest shown in the broadcast of the minor league ball games that have been selected to fill in on the major league open date. And we'll continue to bring you these ball games just as long as we know you like. Well, the ball game we were bringing you here this afternoon at the end of uh, seven innings was 13 to 3 in favor of the White Sox over the St. Louis Browns. And we're still waiting to see whether Charlie Berry and the umpires. Stephen, Duffy, and Summers get their heads together and say, yes, boys, let's go ahead and try to continue this summer. What are we going to wash it out? Right now, the rain has stopped completely. See, the umpires have now stuck their heads out of the dugout of the White Sox, and we may have a decision made on this any moment. In the meantime, we'll hang right on here and uh, see if we can't talk a little baseball along with you and uh, find out exactly what they're going to do. Say, Al, I uh, want to butt in here for a moment. And you can butt in for a lot of moments, buddy. Don't you give me that minute stuff now. Over to the front box right next to us here at Comiskey Park, Warren Brown, the sports editor of the Herald American, has been following the fortunes of both the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox for many, many years. He's hollering out of the window down at the umpires, and the White Sox dug out to play ball. He wants to get home. I noticed him a little while ago, Al. Uh, he gave the fellow that runs the numbers on the scoreboard out there a peanut shower. Years back, uh, when I was broadcasting out at uh, Wrigley Field, Los Angeles, Bob Elton and Pat Flanagan used to come on to the Cubs and the White Sox. They'd get down at the microphone, which is right behind the screen, down behind home plate, and the press box was right above them. Warren Brown would always be giving you that peanut shower, and I just happened to remind me of years gone by when he gave the fellow in the corner here that peanut shower. And I remember well once, he must have bought at least 15 pounds of peanuts and set them on us all at one time out there. Well, you want to watch yourself because that Elton is right back here now on our booth using our telephone for which he can collect 25 cents on each call. <laughs> <laughs> I take my life in my hand. Yes, boy. sir. See, the umpires have come out now to examine the uh, diamond art to see whether or not this ball game will continue. Charlie Perry stepping around first base down there. They didn't get first base covered during the rainstorm and it really came down here with a torrential downpour. Right now, the groundskeepers are being asked to come out. Charlie Berry wants to talk to the head groundskeeper here to see whether or not they're going to be able to drain the park enough for the ball game to continue. It's been held up now for approximately half an hour. Well, I see they're flying out. There goes one over. Yeah. So, uh, I guess I don't have to climb on that choo-choo mat after all. I guess I can get that plane over can at 6 o'clock on American Airlines. That'll be the number six of that Mercury. And the groundskeepers have come out now. And Charlie Perry talking to them. Looks as though we might be able to get the water soft up down there first base and this ball game back underway. Of course, it'll be a few minutes before that happens. It's a 13-3 ball game in favor of the White Sox, and we'd like to tell you just exactly how things started. For the Browns, they come on in the first inning and with one man out, Cooper, the number two hitter up in the order. Red back and hit a home run into the right field stands off Saul Riverton and put the Browns right in front one to nothing. It was the only one they picked up in the first inning. Coming back in the last half of the first inning, the White Sox threatened, got a man, Nelson Fox as far as third base, but he died there, so at the end of one inning, it was one to nothing down. In the second inning, with two outs, 
Young, Bob Young, the second baseman, doubled the right center, and Hunter was walked intentionally. Then Littlefield came up and smacked the line drive into right center field. And the starting pitcher for the Browns registered his first run batted into the afternoon. That meant that the Browns were ahead to nothing. Then the White Sox rolled back in the last half of the first inning with Rivera tripling and coming in when Red Wilson set a high fly ball in the right field. So it was two to one ball game then. And in the top of the third inning, as in the fourth and fifth, the Browns failed to score. But the White Sox came roaring back with three in the last half of the third inning and picked up those three runs to end their total of four. So it was a four to two ball game at the end of three full innings of play. Then there was no more scoring in the ball game until the Browns came along in the first half of the sixth inning and put a pair of doubles together, followed by a pair of singles together, followed by a line drive in the right field by Young to drive in a run. So it was a four to three ball game as we moved into the last half of the sixth inning. But that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Because 11 men came to the plate in the last half of the sixth inning in which the White Sox scored six times and uh, on five base hits. I read it seven times. Seven times on five base hits to run the total. The total up to 11. And from there on, it was sort of pretty by the door. As the Browns had given way almost completely. Then scoring the top half of the seventh inning, rolling out in the easy order. And in the last half of the seventh inning, two runs were picked up by the White Sox to run their total of 13. And the rings came down in the seventh inning. And just as the seventh inning had ended, Minoso flying to right field for two runs, two hits, and one error. The rings held up the ball game, and it's been the next status ever since. A 13-3 affair in favor of Chicago, who are in third place in the American League, six and a half games off the pace at game time. And with the New York Yankees having lost their ball game to the Boston Red Sox, it means that right now, the White Sox are only six games behind, and should they win this one, and it seems likely that they will, they'll be only five and one-half games behind in the American League. So the Yankee lead is dwindling. Milwaukee is apparently trying to pick up again, because uh, the information has come in that uh, Milwaukee has defeated Cincinnati 10-2. I think uh, Art has the, uh, has the rest of the scores for him. Right up to the minute, and then we'll give you all the facts and figures and information on uh, the rest of the baseball games immediately following the broadcast of this one on the scoreboard. Now the ground crew is coming out to take off the canvas, so they're going to try to get this one started again. So I had a few more run over uh, the scores we have now. I'd appreciate it very much, and uh, I want to see what Charlie Berry and crew down there are going to do. Well, right now, uh, the Milwaukee players evidently have shaken their... Uh, Batting slump because the score just came in. Milwaukee defeated the Cincinnati Reds 10 to 2. Other games in the National League: Pittsburgh in 11 innings this afternoon defeated the New York Giants 5 to 3. Philadelphia and Brooklyn and Chicago and St. Louis the National League are playing tonight. The Boston Red Sox handed the Yankees their ninth loss in a row as Mel Parnell pitched a four-hit shutout. Boston four, the New York Yankees nothing. At the end of eight innings. Detroit 4, Cleveland 2, Seth Gray going all the way to the Tigers, Lemon started, and Bob Hooper came on to pitch in the eighth inning for the Cleveland Indians. The only other game in the American League scheduled for today is Washington at Philadelphia, and they're playing under the lights. Now, all right, let's see. For Mel Parnell, I believe that'll be his tenth win. And uh, he pitched his second shutout of the current campaign. He's sort of the bell cow of the Boston Red Sox staff, and I can imagine he feels pretty fine about his victory over the New York Yankees. Everyone around the baseball circuit, wherever we go, keeps saying, Al, what, what happened to the Yankees? What are they doing? Well, I guess it's just one of those things that'll happen to a ball club. It's happened many, many times. As I pointed out once before, when the question was asked me, I said, well, in uh, 1951, the New York Giants creeped up on the Brooklyn Dodgers, who blew a 13-game lead in the National League. So, when things like that happen to a ball club that's really rolling, well, you can just figure that uh, a slump will hit most any team. And it's no respecter of talent or personnel. 
Uh, when the slump comes, it usually bites you pretty hard. But a lot of the folks are saying, too, that they're glad to see the Milwaukee uh, suddenly shaken uh, their losing streak. They had eight, as you recall, and uh, then stopped at a date when they beat Cincinnati last night in the second game of the Twilight Doubleheader. And here this afternoon, they jumped on Cincinnati again. Milwaukee getting ten runs and Cincinnati getting only two. So we'll be watching very closely in the National League particularly because the race is tight in the National League right now and has all indications of being tightened down in the American League with the New York Yankees having lost their ball game again today. That means that uh, their game lead will be cut by one full game over the second place club. The Cleveland Indians should be Cleveland Indians come through and win their ball game. They're behind right now at the end of eight innings, fourth two, Detroit leading them. But uh, one can never tell about a game of that sort, as uh, quite often they'll come back and uh, bounce it. And the final score has just been put up on the board here at uh, Comiskey Park in Chicago. Detroit has beaten the second place Cleveland Indians, so they'll make no ground on the Yankees today. It's a 4-2 affair in favor of Cleveland, in favor of Detroit over Cleveland. So that means that Cleveland getting along to uh, try to pick up ground on the Yankees will not do so today. But uh, here at uh, Comiskey Park, the third place Chicago White Sox can pick up ground on the Yankees if this ball game should not get back underway or if they are able to go ahead and uh, beat the St. Louis Browns and they lead right now 13 to 3. So the White Sox can move up to the ahead of the Cleveland Indians actually in percentage points, I believe. I'll pick that up and make absolutely certain. Chicago, six and a half games off the pace, and Cleveland, five games off the pace at game time today. Well, it means that uh, Cleveland will still remain five games off the pace, but uh, six and a half games, Chicago behind. That means they'll pick up a full game if they win this one over New York, who lost their ball game today. That'll mean that they'll be exactly five and one half. So it'll be just a half game that Chicago will be in third place. So it makes the race pretty tight in the American League. As far as the fourth place Boston Red Sox are concerned, they are ten and a half games out before uh, they race the Yankees today. That means they're nine and a half games out now. So the race tightens up there. And in the National League, we'll find it, it will continue to be tight. In the ball games played between Brooklyn, Milwaukee, St. Louis, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia game time today. We're only uh, three games off the pace being set by the Brooklyn Dodgers. So it means between the first place ball club and the fourth place ball club, there are only three games different. The fifth place New York Giants were seven and a half games down, and they lost to Pittsburgh today, so that'll drop them down a little bit more. It all depends on what Brooklyn's going to do in their ball game with Philadelphia tonight. Of course, that has to be considered. Milwaukee, however, has picked up that half game, and uh, Brooklyn is going to have to uh, win their ball game tonight if they want to stay on top in the National League. They already have that information there, and of course, they'll be going out with blood and eye tonight to see if they can do something about it. So New York and Philadelphia, or rather Brooklyn and Philadelphia, in that ball game at Brooklyn tonight, looms as a very important affair, because after all, the Philadelphia Phillies are struggling too to stay up in the first division and also get nearer and nearer the top. And they're only three games out. That gives them an opportunity too of picking up one full game on the league-leading Brooklyn Ducks. Well, right now the groundskeepers are taking the car falling off the field as the umpires stand around and wait. And I want you to know they're doing it very slowly. As after all, the White Sox are leading in this ball game and uh, I wouldn't have been surprised if Mr. Richards would just as leave hang up the spikes for the afternoon because it would mean that his ball club would have tucked another one into the record books as a win in their favor. And in case you just tuned in with us, we should like to remind you that at the end of seven full innings of play, the score, the White Sox 13, the Browns 3.
Right back here at Comiskey Park in Chicago, where we're still waiting to see whether or not they're going to continue this ball game or not. We've been talking a lot about the Chicago White Sox and what they've been doing and so forth. Well, one of the happiest guys I ran into when he was on his last swing in the East was Bob Elson, the fine Chicago White Sox broadcaster. So, uh, well, the last time I saw him, he said, boy, we beat those uh, athletics, we beat the New York Yankees, boy, we're ready to go. And talking about the go-go Sox, well, they were stopped last night, but they came roaring back here this afternoon, did the Bob? Yes, they sure did, Al. You know, the big story about the White Sox in their last Eastern trip was the story of the cat. Did you hear the cat story? No, uh, Art started to tell me something about it, but uh, play interfered. We have to play down there now, so Ma, we're all here, boy. Go ahead. I tell you, in the second game, or the opening game of the New York Yankees series, uh, the White Sox, uh, it was in the first half of the second inning, a cat ran out of the right field stand someplace, and the first thing we saw was the cat was down around first base. And the Yankees uh, all tried to catch the cat and couldn't, and he came over back of the plate, and then some fans ran out of the aisles and tried to catch the cat, and they couldn't get him. So finally the cat nonchalantly turned around and walked into the White Sox dugout. And I claimed that that was the charm, mm -hmm. that the cat really gave us the fur and the incentive. And he was a black and white cat, and I saw the cat again uh, the next day. I went down in the stock. You know where the visiting dressing room is on the oh, sure. stadium. Sure. Well, I saw this cat there again the next day with an orange cat. And the following day, I got there early before the ball game again, went down into the where they serve food to the press and radio, and I saw the cat again. So I gave the cat credit for all this, and uh, we started quite a cat story here. I don't know how many cans and boxes of sardines have been mailed in here, and I got uh, wires from all over the country about that cat. Have you still got it? Have you still got it, though, Bob? Well, the story about the cat is, you see, we have a number of writers with us uh, traveling with the team. They weren't wise to the cat story. And all of a sudden, with all the excitement breaking loose on the cat, their editors start to wire, send the stories on, on the cat. The whole town is talking about the cat. Well, they hadn't been in on the cat story, so they are saying now, you know, that there was no cat. However, I am going to show the cat on television tonight, the picture of the cat. They, they run a big picture here the day after that game in the Chicago paper showing the cat on the field and yeah. people trying to catch him, Bill Dickey trying to get a hold of him. Well, I've got that picture enlarged, and I'm going to show it on television here tonight at 6 o'clock. <laughs> so any of these fellows that say there was no cat, I don't know where they were. They must not have been there. Because that is the fabulous cat that started these White Sox really rocking them and stocking them. And if you'd have seen a fly ball that uh, Minoso hit at Boston, that was going to foul. was in on that too. Well, <laughs> many Minoso claims that only the cat brought that back, that ball back in the air because that ball was gone, foul way up over in the left-hand corner, and all of a sudden it hit a wind current there, and Stephen took his head, turned his head away, and before he knew it, that ball dropped behind him, and the winning run was in. And we claim that was due to the cat again. Well, I'll be doggone. Well, look, uh, Bob, I've said time and time again, I know uh, I've heard you say it too, that perhaps the most superstitious crowd in the world, crowd that plays this game of baseball. And I imagine that they're looking for all these little things so they can yeah. uh, build their superstitions even higher. Well, that's right. Uh, ball players are very, very superstitious. They tell stories from way back to the beginning of time, even in, uh, in the old days, in the McGraw era. There were certain ball players that played for McGraw that would never eat except in one restaurant. And if they got on a hitting jag, they'd eat the same thing every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and never change until they went out into a slump. But say a pitcher would win a couple of games in a row, he'd go on a certain, he'd eating a certain thing and in a certain place, he'd never want to eat anything else. They'd eat the same thing all the time. They are just about as superstitious as any group of people there are. Well, you remember old Red Lucas, what a fine Yeah, pitcher. very well. Red Lucas would never touch the foul lines as he walked across. He'd yeah. get to get over him. I remember that. Very, that many times. Very, very well. Somebody, I forget who it was now, would never go to second base without a rabbit's foot in his pocket. Was that Moranville? 
could have been. That's uh, and been quite a long time ago. Then there's the fellow always had a, a little wad of gum underneath the peak of his cap. That's right. Up at the plate. Oh, there have been all kinds of things. I know you're, you're not superstitious, are you, Bob? No, I'm not superstitious. All I would like is playing Jim Rummy and some better cards. That's all. I, I just can't seem to get him to do something I can play. Now it's good to see you. I better get back to work. It's awful nice to see you two, Bob. And come in and visit us any time you see this mutual microphone around. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Elson, the fine broadcaster of the Chicago White Sox, coming in to tell us the cat story that's been rattling all over the city of Chicago and has been going through the eastern seaboard like crazy and wouldn't be a bit surprised that uh, perhaps the paper in your uh, hometown will be picking it up very soon. It's, it's quite a fabulous story with all of the White Sox players claiming that the cat has brought them a great deal of luck. I don't know what they were blaming their loss on last night, but uh, here this afternoon, they must have found the cat before because they've really been bombarding the St. Louis Browns here today. Well, as we said a few minutes ago, they're going to try to continue this ball game. They have ordered sand to be brought out and put over the right side of the diamond. So the groundskeepers are wheeling out the sand now and will be spread. So in the meantime, this ball game has been held up now, I would say, for about 40 to 45 minutes. And uh, we've been trying to stay here with it for the simple reason that we've expected most any second that the game would either be called off or they would say, go ahead and let's try to continue it. The rain has stopped completely here at Comiskey Park, so we'll hold up and see whether or not we're going to be able to get it in. In the meantime, we'd just like to alert our good friend Rocco Tito back at the studio and tell him uh, one thing for sure, that if this hangs on much longer and uh, they are going to be any slower about it, well, we might have to have some of that very fine music we know those records back there could produce. Unless Hart has brought along uh, his or mouth organ and his guitar and wants to play a little for us. Yeah, but I can't sing today. <laughs> the outlet right side of the infield looks uh, in pretty bad shape, though. I saw Charlie Berry step out on it a moment ago, and he went up to uh, about halfway up the ski top. In the mud, that'd be kind of dangerous. Unless they, uh, that dries out in a hurry, somebody take a quick turn around first base, they're liable to turn an ankle. Well, that's right. I, I know that many times ball players have been hurt trying to continue ball games, and it's cost the ball club several games before they were able to get back in the lineup. And uh, I do know that they don't like to take any more chances with uh, the infield, and they absolutely have to. But still, the groundskeepers weren't able to get this one covered here completely today when the rains were coming down. So uh, the right side of it arc is in pretty bad condition. However, the sand and uh, sawdust they'll be putting on here in a few minutes may uh, soak it up. I can remember back in uh, 1936, yeah, 36, down at Cincinnati, an opening day, and it snowed before uh, the ball game had started, and they had gotten out and swept the infield off, and then, lo and behold, we saw about a misty drizzle, a cold misty drizzle, and it melted all that snow, and before the ball game could be put on at all, the groundskeepers had to come out and spread uh, a mixture of oil and sawdust with sand all over the infield, and they lit it on to dry it off. And they went ahead and played that ball game between Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. And I imagine if you wanted to ask him the story about it, Chuck Dresden would remember to tell you about it, because Chuck was managing down at Cincinnati at that time. Remember, we worked a whole year with uh, Chuck Dresden as manager of the Cincinnati Reds. That's when uh, Lee Grissom was their old fireballer. And they were working him about every other day. And uh, Grissom kept the Cincinnati ball club in the National League that year. And I remember uh, I was working the ball games there with uh, the old redhead, Red Barber. He had quite a time. Every time we turned around, uh, Grissom was coming into pitch. And uh, I don't remember whether he pitched that day or not, but I believe if memory serves me right, he either pitched or relieved that day. But I do know that the infield was in bad condition. The outfield was very bad, but they went ahead and opened anyway and had a capacity crowd across the field. And old Larry McPhail was the general manager down there in the major domo. And when Larry said, yeah, we're going to go ahead and play, everyone said, uh, gee, you think you're on the edge? Just put the information out on the radio. We put it out on the radio, and lo and behold, those people picked up their tickets, walked down to the ballpark, sat there with their teeth shattering while the two clubs went. And if memory serves me rightly, old Red Lucas, we were talking about a few minutes ago, pitched that opening day for Pittsburgh. Well, uh, uh, you look back on some of those times, and... Uh, very pleasant memory sort of pop up. You uh, get to thinking about some of the old pitchers, the old hitters, the old catchers. Wonder what they're doing now. But uh, 
one of the cars that's breezing along just about that time in the National League was a guy that works with us almost every day, Dizdeen. He was still throwing that fireball of his, all right? And I can remember his throwing it down at Pittsburgh because I'd gone to Cincinnati from Pittsburgh, moved over from the broadcasting coop in Pittsburgh to Cincinnati, and uh, we'd seen a lot of uh, Diz working against those Wainer boys down in uh, the city of Pittsburgh, and those two Wainers really would hit you to death when they got the opportunity. Many times people have said they couldn't understand why it was so much, much fine talent on the Pittsburgh Ball Club of that particular era that uh, they never did finish any higher than they did. Just quite often you'll find out that you'll get uh, some very fine talent on paper, and when it gets down to the final analysis, it doesn't gel as a team. And if it doesn't gel as a team, you can have the greatest talent in the world and still have a ball club that will lose it for you. And that's what happened, I think, with Pittsburgh, because they did have some fine stars. And Woody Jensen, who is one of the outstanding outfielders of his day, and he had the two winners in the outfield down there. You had Tommy Sevenar, you had Pye Trainer, one of the greatest third basemen of all time. You also had Archie Vaughn coming up. Lavagetto was a young fellow then breaking in. And you had Gus Stewart first base. He could hit that long ball for you. And Patton and Grace behind the plate. And Gibson had some uh, pretty good ball players down there. Wade Hoyt was the pitcher that, uh, well, he was like uh, Grissom. Every time he turned around, Wade Hoyt was coming on. You had Mace Brown down there. You had Larry French. You had a lot of fellas that were really able to pitch that ball. And Bill Swift for another Pitched a lot of fine ball for Pittsburgh at that time. Jack Salverson was with the ball club. Jack Salverson, I understand, Art, is still going along out on the West Coast and is one of the leading pitchers in the Pacific Coast. And he must be at least uh, old enough to uh, say hello to you. Yeah, he's about my age. I understand, though, uh, huh? <laughs> last year he had a tremendous year along with uh, Johnny Lindell, who Fred Haney brought up to the Pittsburgh Pirates this year. But I understand now that Jack's through playing ball, and uh, he's gone into business around Long Beach. Somebody uh, was telling me that was in Chicago the other day from the coast. Salverson was out of baseball? Yeah, oh, that's, that's impossible. Finally found out, Al. That's impossible. Salverson can't give up on baseball. I'm watching that fellow spread that sawdust around. Reminds me of a story back in about 1930-31, uh, long when about the time that Bobo Newton was fishing with the Los Angeles Club out from the Coast League, and they came up to Portland, Oregon. And it was your last visit in there, and of course you know, Al, that it rains once in a while around Oregon. What do you mean once in a while, buddy? <laughs> if your mother's listening in, she'll disown you. Well, a rainstorm came up in uh, the morning. It was a Sunday game, and uh, Los Angeles Club wasn't coming back into the Northwest uh, anymore that season. So Jack Lunnebelt, who at that time was managing the Los Angeles Club, uh, he wanted to get the games in. So I remember I took my car and Jack got in his uniform. We went to a gas station and kept buying that gasoline by the five-gallon cans. We spread it around with a lot of sawdust around the infield. And he even had his uh, ball club out there in uniform spreading the sawdust around. <laughs> and they finally burned the field off in pretty good shape and they got the games in. Of course, up here in the major leagues where they have so many, uh, so many groundkeepers, uh, the ball players don't have to work, but out in those minor leagues, you got uh, probably one or two fellas to pull that big tarpaulin, and uh, you don't have too much help out there. You were speaking a minute ago about uh, Archie Vaughn and those fellas, Al. I can well remember uh, how Woody Jensen and another fellow that I see every winter up in Oregon, Jim Mosoff. Remember that big outfit? Oh, leader? yeah. Well, Woody, he's still up in Oregon? Yeah, he's uh, working up in Salem, Oregon. Got a very fine position up there. And right as you go in his den, he's got a life-size picture of Pie Trainer along with Babe Ruth when the Pirates and the Yankees played the World Series. And you know, the first thing that impressed me when I look at that picture is the size of the gloves that they used in those days. It looked like they got them at the uh, uh, drugstore someplace. Just fairly big enough to get your hand into them. And now they've got those fancy gloves. I always get the ball players. I go around the leagues up here today, Al, and I said, how can you miss one with a glove like this? But uh, I well remember the day, a very dear friend of mine at that time, Art Griggs, owned the Wichita Club, the Western League. And to get Archie Vaughn, he purchased uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, purchased the whole ball club. And on the ball club that time, uh, Bruce Weber, who later came up as general manager of the Chicago Cubs, is now retired. Uh, they happened to send Woody Jensen and Jim Mosoff over to Arch Bridge as a favor at Wichita, and lo and behold, when Pittsburgh bought the ball club, Los Angeles lost two pretty good ball players. You put your life in Jensen and uh, Mosoff. 
And as you mentioned, Archie Vaughn, uh, there was a little left-hand pitcher that year that came up, and I can remember when the Pirates trained out on the coast next year, I always said he had the greatest curveball that I ever saw. Who was that? A left-hander by the name of Wood. Wood. I think he stayed one year with the Pirates, and that's the last oh, I ever heard yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I remember they were playing the White Sox in uh, Wrigley Field, an exhibition game, and Luke Gaffling came up to hit against him. And he'd take that bat and swing down on the ball just like he was putting Kenley. He had a curveball and he'd start about a foot over your head and it'd break right around your knee. I never saw a fellow with a curveball and he pitched, I think, just one year and uh, that's the last day. That's the fellow I was asking you one afternoon who the little left-hander was who came up with Pittsburgh and lasted only one year. Pitched his heart out that one year and never came back to the majors. That's the guy I was talking about, and I couldn't remember his name, and it pops up on the broadcast this afternoon. How about well, uh, Al, he probably got a crook in his arm from throwing so many curves that he could never get it straight out. <laughs> well, that's probably very true. I think we ought to tell the folks along with that work, Art, that uh, they're still trying to take care of the grounds here at Comiskey Park in Chicago. As soon as they uh, get them all squared away, we're going to have this ball game to continue. But in case you just tuned in late with us, we should like to say that at the end of seven innings of play, the game was halted. And the score at that time was the Chicago White Sox 13 and the St. Louis Browns 3. What's more here is Charlie Ferry has called the pitchers to come out and warm up and get started here. He wants to finish this ball game. The right side of the infield has been covered with sand, has been covered uh, pretty completely. So it looks as though this ball game is going to get back underway in just a few minutes. 13 to 3 affair in favor of the White Sox, and the Browns will be coming to bat in the top half of the eighth inning with Lenhart, Courtney, and Dyke in that order. Dorsch has gone back to the mound now to get warmed up. In the meanwhile, we've received a, letter, a wire from Greenville, Mississippi, Art, from Bill Mon, the general manager and former scout for the Braves and the Giants. He's a general manager of the ball club at Greenville, Mississippi. And his wire tells us that they're listening into the game of the day down there in their air-cooled runway of Sportsman's Park in Greenville, Mississippi. Air-cooled, get that now. Well. And he says uh, that their ball club down there has won 22 of their last 29 games and is only one game out of first place in a very close race in the Cotton States League. Well, uh, they've done pretty well, Art, because as late as February, the 8th of this year, they didn't even have a ball club together. They didn't have a player. But uh, they've got them now, and they're going... They're going to play Jackson tonight, incidentally, and uh, I hope the folks down around there are going to get out and see Greenville play Jackson tonight down in the Cotton States League. Come on, you've got to cheer that ball club if you want them to come into first place now and stay there. So, uh, so uh, we'll pass along all the regards that uh, Bill Mon has sent, and we sincerely hope that they have a lot of good luck down there, and we'd like to wish good luck to all the ball clubs in the minor leagues this year. Not only this year, but for as many years as they decide they're going to operate. After all, uh, baseball is one game that America has really taken to its heart and would like to keep right there as its national pastime. You were talking, we were talking about Charlie Berry a few minutes ago, uh, Art, and uh, you slipped over here and said that you remember when Charlie Berry caught out where? He's the catch for the Portland Beavers out in the coast, Miguel. I've got news for you. He still remembers having caught out there, too. <laughs> He'll tell you some wild and woolly stories about having been in the Pacific Coast League. Just get him cornered sometime, Art. I'll tell you when you get him cornered. Get him cornered after his day's work is doing his having dinner at some uh, restaurant. And just walk up to him and say, uh, Charlie, I understand that the greatest years of your life were spent out on the Pacific Coast, brother, and he'll take off like six inches. Well, I can remember, uh, Al, when he was testing out there, we had a, a Ford in Vancouver, and there was a young lieutenant who was quite a baseball fan, he used to come over and watch the ball games. And lo and behold, after the war was over, Charlie went on that trip, you know, that the umpires and the players take to Germany. And uh, this fellow who happened to be a young lieutenant at Vancouver back when he was playing with Pullman was at that time a general in charge of Trieste. And uh, is now stationed in New York, a very fine baseball fan, General Seabree. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember when I was in Germany, uh, General Seabree and myself were the only two that uh, got the sporting news from my very good friend down there in St. Louis, Mr. J.G. Taylor Spink. Hey, you know something I haven't heard from J.G. Taylor Spink for so long, I think he must have crossed me off his list. 
Well, I imagine he's a pretty busy man right now, Al, but uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, uh, you'll be hearing from one these days because I know every once in a while I'll get a wire from him. He said, where are you and what are you doing? He said, uh, you know, we were talking a few minutes ago, Art, about uh, wondering how many uh, Yankees have lost straight as their own record. Uh, we weren't able to come up with it. Well, Ray Brinson of Tampa, Florida, comes up with a piece of information by telegram that we've just received here at the broadcasting booth in Comiskey Park in Chicago. He informs us, and now this is according to Ray Brinson, and we're going to have to check it. But uh, we're not going to doubt his word because this is the best piece of authority we have right now. He says that the Yankees lost nine straight in 1945. The all-time club record is 13 in a row 40 years ago. 13 or 40 years ago. Boy, they've been playing some rough baseball, haven't they? That was about the time that Casey Stengel broke in, wasn't it? <laughs> Thought you were going to look over here and say that was about the time we saw our first ball game. I was about to hit you on the head with these binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Art Baseball is a great game. It keeps records, and uh, we like to delve back in the records, look at them, and see what's been going on, and sort of compare what the boys did then with the type of equipment they had, compared to what the boys are doing today with the type of equipment that now prevails in the game. Talking about the game prevailing, it's about to start right now. Get back underway for the top of the eighth inning. And it's been almost an hour since the rain came down and stopped it at the end of seven, with the White Sox leading 13 to three. Well, I thought you did a lot of Jim, uh, Kinnan and John in the seventh inning when the White Sox scored seven times. But I'm going to tell you something. Frankly, uh, a few thousand chosen, chosen words have been poured out since that last half of that seventh inning uh, went in the book. The last half of the sixth inning went in the book. And, uh, well, if we have any more uh, words left, we're carrying right on here to top the eighth inning. Usual game of the day is on Kometsky Park in Chicago. Let's go that uh, six o'clock plane. All right, we'll have to go without helpers tonight. Yeah, I think if it hadn't been for that uh, big six inning out, you might have been on that plane. This game might have been over. Could have been, Art, but it rattled right along and took up a considerable amount of time. Now let's see how much time either two innings of this remaining ball game will take up or perhaps an inning and a half. In the top of the eighth inning, the first man up for the St. Louis Browns will be Don Lenhart. He's had one base hit in three tries. Track one back to the middle in the third inning. Lenhart, a 284 hitter at game time, is standing in. And Harry Joyce, the relief pitcher of the Chicago White Sox, trying to save this game for Charles Rutherford and the White Sox. And it seems as though he's about to do it with a 13-3 ball game cooking, a 10-run lead. He delivers to right-hand hitting Don Lenhart a curveball over for ball strike one. So we've got this one back underway. Just for the fun of it, Art, will you check how many minutes uh, this ball game is held up by rain? Next pitch is swung on. There's a line drive hit into left field. It's in there for a base hit. And Don Lenhart opens the eighth inning for the Browns with a line drive single to left. Off the race, that's hit number one. Hit number eight all told for the Browns. 21 basics we've had here this afternoon, and they have produced 13 runs. George getting ready now to pitch to Clint Courtney, left-hand hitting catcher. Clint drove a single into right field back in the sixth inning, his only base hit and three times up. Little Bulldog standing in, wears glasses. Leading off at first base and not taking too big a lead is Don Lenhart. Slippery going under feet. So we're ready now for the pitch on court. Then it comes, Clint swings on it, fouls it off. All right, strike one on him. How many minutes, Art, right, was it held up? Exactly 55 minutes, Al. Well, about that. 55 minutes held up here in Chicago. Now we're ready for the next pitch on court. Count is no balls in one strike. Harry Dorch sets his runner Linhart over first base. Delivers the plate. Six high and outside. Count is one ball and one strike. Del Courtney wiggles down into position there at the plate. Gets ready. In comes the 1-1 delivery. Fastball, and this is low and outside for ball two. 
We've lost a considerable amount of the wind that was blowing here at Chicago up until uh, the rain starts swirling in. So perhaps the blow is entirely over. Here's the 2 1 delivery now on Clint Courtney. Doris cuts it loose. A half speed curveball high off the shoulder for ball three. So Courtney's out in front now, three and one. Looks down at Marty Marion behind third to see what to do about this next one. Should it be in there? John Lenhart opened the belated eighth inning with a single. Wrapped in the left field, and he's on at first base. Now the 3 1 delivery. Doris cuts it loose. Fastball swung on. Hit back past Doris. Right out into center field for a base hit. Lenhart slipped as he got started and can move around only to second base. So Courtney gets the base hit here behind one rifled by Lenhart. And the Browns have picked up two of Doris here in the beginning of the eighth inning. So coming up to the plate now is Jim Dyke, who got a bunch single back in the sixth inning. His only base hit three times up. All right-hand hitter. Runners at first and second now for the Browns. They're trying to cook something up and get back into this ball game. They're ten runs behind as the White Sox lead them 13 to 3. Dorish checks his runners at both stations. Looks down at Dyke. Delivers him a fastball that is over for call strike one. Fired right through at the knee. Shout out for the Browns, top the eighth inning, two base runners. Harry Dorish in relief for the White Sox. Little barrel chested right hander, checks his runner at second, throws a side on curveball. Ball is over the fifth on the inside corner to right hand hitter for call strike two. On the count on Jimmy Dyke is no balls and two strikes. Dyke will be followed by Young, and if anyone else is needed, shortstop Bill Hunter. George gets ready. Looks down, takes his time from Sherman Lawler. Rears back, throws the fastball, it's swung on, hit down to shortstop, up with it as Marsh, or rather Stevens, fires back to Nelly Fox at second for the four shot. The throw on the first is not in time. So Dyke is on at first base, on the fourth side of Courtney's second. Brown short second. Running on the ground out, Len Hart moves into third. Go over the White Sox again for you because it's not the same ball club that started. Harry Joyce relieved Rogovin. He's on the mound. Sherman Lawler relieved Wolfen behind the plate, so he's catcher. At first is Ferris Bay. Nelson Fox is at second. Freddie Marsh started the ball game at shortstop for the White Sox, but Junior Stevens is in there now, and the third baseman is Bob Elliott. But also in left, Rivera in center, and in right is Sam Mealy. Doris now to pitch to left-hand hitting Bob Young, who has two base hits in two official tries. Tries to strike at him at the knees and gets it right in there as Young watches the trail by. Here's the 0-1 delivery now on Young, leading over the plate. Starts to go for an inside curveball, changes his mind, and takes the pitch for ball one. One ball and one strike. One out, two on here in the top of the eighth inning. The Browns are trying to pick up a couple more runs. They're being led 13-3 to by the Chicago White Sox, who are trying to pick up ground on the defeated New York Yankees, who lost their ninth straight ball game this afternoon with Parnell and the Red Sox shutting them out. Four to nothing. George ready. Delivers fastball. Swung on. Hit right back past the mound into center field for a base hit. So Young strikes one back through the middle with Lenhart coming in to score the fourth. St. Louis Browns run. That is hit number three, run number one off Dory. And on the play, Jimmy Dyke moves down to second to hold on. So two runs batted in here this afternoon by second baseman Young. Now a 13 to 4 ball game in favor of the White Sox. Coming up to the plate now is Hunter. Down in the bullpen, we have uh, Sandy Consuegra warming up for Chicago, and Luke Kreplo in the bullpen for the St. Louis Browns. Luke Kreplo, former Chicago White Sox pitcher. Joyce, ready to face Bill Hunter now, the shortstop, who swings on the first pitch and hits a high foul ball back to the screen. Four strike one. Runners at first and second. One out for the Browns. They've scored one time here in the eighth inning. 13-4 in favor of the White Sox. 
Neutrals game of the day from Comiskey Park in Chicago. Ball game held up 55 minutes because of rain. And we've just gotten back to the top half the inning. Harry Doyle is ready now. Delivers a one. It's swung on. There's a hard fly ball. Hung out into left center field. Jim Rivera goes over, gets under it, makes the catch, and the runners hold on. So we have out number two. And coming up to the plate now should be Mike Fliska. Unless we have a pinch hitter. And it looks as though we're going to have a pinch hitter. Mike Fliska is not going to hit. Hitting left handed is Hank Edwards. Batting for Bobo Holloman. So Fliska, I meant Holloman. Is Hank Edwards batting for him? Ready for first pitch now down to Edwards. And it rides. A fastball over for called strike one. Hank Edwards batting left handed. In comes the pitch. Swung on. There's a hearty ground ball down to Nelly Fox at second. Down in the mud puddle. He goes on one knee, picks it up, fires to first base, and that's all for the ball. Edwards batting here in the eighth inning. Grounds out from Nelson Fox to Ferris Bay. So in the eighth inning, one run for the Browns on three base hits. There were no errors and two men were left off. So the score at the end of the first half of the eighth inning, the St. Louis Browns have four and the Chicago White Sox 13. Strikes on Bob Henry. 
Last half, in number eight, the Mr. Parker Chicago. Elliot has had one big hit and four times up. He's got a double to right field back in the sixth inning. A double produced two runs. Kepler works a big curveball. Elliot snaps his head back and takes a curve under the chin for ball one. One ball and one strike. Elliot left foot forward to the plate. Over the close back. Feet wide, spread apart. Kretler, all scattered on the right hand and delivers. There's a ball hit to short. Up with it. Here's the short stop. Fires to Roy Stevens at first base. And that is all for Elliot. Hunter to Stevens. One away last half of the eighth inning. And Jim Rivera, who had one triple today, then was robbed of a triple in the third inning on a field play when he failed to touch first base. Called out. Jim heading left-handed. Ready for the first six to Rivera. Fred Lowe, his former teammate. Starts in motion. Delivers. Big curve. Ball snapped off outside. One ball and no strike. Immediately following the broadcast of this ball game from Comiskey Park, we'll have a complete rundown of everything on the scoreboard. All the facts and figures. Fred Lowe works a fast curve. Then off the first swung on and tossed it by Rivera. The airplanes today going over this park now so low that uh, you can almost reach up and touch them. Retro takes a sign from Dave Martin. Relief catch for the Browns. In comes the pitch. Rivera reaches for an outside fastball and fouls it up into the second tier off the third baseline. One ball and two strikes. Down on Jump and Jim Rivera. Baseball has been taking a peculiar turn here in the majors in the last about a week and a half. The Yankees in the slide, Milwaukee having split eight games. So the complexion of the picture can change. There's a let up fastball. Swung on by Rivera, up down the left field line, and it is just outside foul into the corner. 352 feet away from home plate. That ball dropped in the corner. Rivera was already pulling up a second. How fast he is. Oh, that's a long last foul strike, and Rivera has to come back and do it all over again. That's the count of one ball, two strikes. One out, last half of the eighth inning. Rivera is up at the plate with nobody on. Score 13 to 4. Now here's Trent Lowe starting his motion. Delivers 1 2. Rivera takes. No one outside for ball two. Out there playing just about straight away for Rivera. He's up there and over his close stance. Trent Lowe, pump. Rivera's back, delivers a curve. Ball 2 2 on the inside off the hips. Ball three. Three balls and two strikes. Low settles down, takes the sign. Rivera waits. 3 2 count on Jim. In comes the 3 2 pitch. Swung on a fastball, fouled right back into the screen. Three balls and two strikes on Rivera. Fastball swung on by Rivera and fouled right back to the left of our broadcasting booth. Count stays right on on Jim at 3 and 2. Littlefield worked 2 in the third. Max Lanier worked 2. George worked 2 thirds of an inning. Grease one third of an inning. Holloman 1 and 2 thirds. And Fredlo is on now. 
of the 3 2 delivery. In a drive, a let up pitch and under the knees for ball four. So Rivera walks with one down here in the ninth, in the eighth inning. And off the low, that's the first base on balls. Six bases on balls have been picked up for the White Sox. The hitter coming up to the plate now is Sam Mealy. Right hand batter. Triple back in the sixth inning. One hit in four at best. He came up twice in the sixth inning. Dribbled and grounded out. The oddity of the sixth inning was that Rivera was two of the three outs in that inning. Kretlow ready to pitch now to Sam Mealy. Fires fastball at him. Near and outside for ball one. Receivers holding the inside corner at first base on Jim Rivera. Fredlo looks back over his left shoulder and checks the line of there. Then delivers a fast curveball at the knees to Mealy. Good for called strike one. One ball and one strike. working out of Mealy on the 1-1 count. So there steps off first. In comes the pitch. A nice curveball, but it's under the knees. Count is 2-1. Ball game has slowed down considerably, Mr. Gleason. Yes, it has. What a fool around here. We won't even be able to get that 8 o'clock play. <laughs> oh, me. That blows. Delivery is swung off by Mealy. There's a line drive. It's right to Young, who grabs it, flips it over to first base. And the Vera is doubled off. A line drive to the second baseman, the throw to first base to get Rivera. So the eighth inning now is his three. And here in the eighth inning for the White Sox. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left on. The score at the end of eight full innings to play now. The White Sox 13 and the Browns 4. Well, you know, there's something about a tall, frosty glass of fall staff that always makes a friendly evening at your favorite tavern just a little bit more enjoyable. And that something is fall staff's genuine premium quality. Guaranteed right on its golden white premium label. Yes, sir, from the first golden clear glass bowl your smiling bartender pours for you, right down to your last satisfying taste. Fall staff is brimful of true premium quality flavor and character that no other beer can equal. Sure, Fall staff is always the choicest product of the brewer's art. We're getting ready now for the top half of the ninth inning. And it's the last call for the St. Louis Browns. A 13 to 4 ball game. I'm going over the chicken scratching on this scorecard to see if I can get all the total facts and figures put together along with the other ball games that have uh, been rolling in this afternoon so we can have a comprehensive look at baseball for today right at the end of this ball game. So, Mr. Gleason, how are about you coming in and doing the top of the night, buddy, huh? Right, Al, we got the top of the batting order coming up for St. Louis Browns and Johnny Grove. He'll be followed by Dick Cocos and then Roy Seavers. The strongly built right-hander, Harry Dorish, on the mound for the White Sox. Swings into his windup, delivers a fastball that's inside for ball one. Dorish came on to relieve Saul Rogerman in the sixth inning after Saul had pitched five and one-third innings. The right-hander delivers again, and it's outside, ball two. Two balls, no strikes, to count on Johnny Grove, leading off here for the St. Louis Browns, top of the ninth inning, as the White Sox lead the Brownies 13-4. to The pitch is high, ball three. Johnny Grove is up for his... Fifth time, he's 0 for 4. Dory's ready. 
The pitch is in there for a call strike. Three balls, one strike. The count on Johnny Grove leading off here in the top of the ninth inning. Joyce delivers it, swung on, and foul tipped into the glove of Sherm Lawler. And it's a full count, three balls, two strikes. Well, should the White Sox win this one this afternoon, they'll gain a game on both the New York Yankees and the Cleveland Indians. The pitch is swung on, there's a ground ball hit out to shortstop up with it is Burn Stevens, the throw to fame. is in time, and that's all for Johnny Grove here in the top of the ninth. Grove bounces out to shortstop. Junior Stevens, the fair is fame. Well, the batter is Dick Cocos. Dick let off of the home run. That blew into the right field seats in the first inning. And since that time, it's gone hitless. So he's one for four. Left-handed batter stands squarely in the center of the left-handed batter's box. Takes a lot of pitch for five, ball one. Joyce gives you a good assortment. He's got a real fast-breaking curve, a slow-breaking curve, a good fastball, and he can slow up on you. There's a fastball that's over for a call strike. 1-1. One, one. Immediately following the ball game, Al Helper will bring you all of the pertinent information on games played around the Major League this afternoon. Call strike two. Look at a fastball over the outside corner. Letter high. One and two. One thing about Dory. He's always close to that plate. He doesn't give you anything too good to hit. Always working around those corners. Around comes the right arm. The one-two pitch is... Gets away from Lawler, ball two. That ball skipped right off the end of Sherm Lawler's catching glove. And it looks as though uh, Joyce might have tossed him up. I think Lawler called for the curve, and he threw him a fastball that sailed a little bit. One out, two two. The count on Dick Cocos. On deck is Roy Severs. Now Dorish is ready. The two two delivery is swung on. There's a high fly ball to right center. Jim Rivera calling for it has plenty of time. Makes the catch. Dick Cocos flies to Jim Rivera in right center, and with two men out, the batter is Roy Severs. Roy has gone hit with some four trips. And now Rivera moves to from right center field where he caught that fly ball over in the left center to play Severs to pull. A sidearm fastball is high inside. Ball one. The right half of the infield is completely covered with sawdust down the third and first base foul line. But the rest of the infield, which was covered during the rain spell, is in very good shape. Doris pitches. It's a call strike one. Stevers. Looked at the fastball. It was right over. 1-1. One, one. Here's your 1-1 delivery to the right-handed batter, and Seaver swings. There's a line drive to right center. It's in there for a base hit. It might go for extra bases. Rivera chasing it down. And no, he takes no chance. Seaver barely held at first base. Very wisely because the putting around first base is a little bit slippery. And at the moment, with the Brownies trailing by nine runs, all Seaver, of course, wanted to do was get on base. It's a base hit for Roy Seavers, and it is hit number 11 for the St. Louis Browns. And here is Don Lenhart, two for four. Big, tall, slender right-handed batter, swings and pops it up in the air down the first baseline. Moving over, getting under it is Waller, and makes the catch. Sturm Waller off that ball, running a full speed towards the Ronnie dugout along the first baseline. And it retires the side, and the ball game is over. For St. Louis here in the top of the ninth inning, there were no runs, one hit, no errors, 
and there was one man left on base. So the Chicago White Sox, after losing the opening game to the St. Louis Browns last night, bounced back here this afternoon and hang up a 13-4 victory. So the St. Louis Browns, after stopping the White Sox with a six-game winning streak, their pitching fell apart this afternoon here at Comiskey Park, and the Brownies walked off with a 13-4 victory. So right now, the ball game's over. Al Helper's on a hurry to catch a plane back to New York. So we're going to bring Al in with the final total. All right, all right, I don't think I can catch that plane in New York, so it's going to be a little bit too late. Well, let's see. The final totals are for Chicago, 13 runs, 13 hits, no errors, five men left on. Love of the winning pitchers, record is five and nine. For the St. Louis Browns, four runs, 11 hits, no errors, nine men left on. The losing pitcher is Littlefield, his record is now three and seven. Kokos is fourth home run of the year in the first inning for the Browns with a base set. Well, that's about all from uh, Kaminsky Park as far as the play-by-play is concerned this afternoon. Our thanks to Mel Firstler, our engineer from WGN, who has ridden through a rainfall and all with us here this afternoon. Of course, it was very good to be back with my old buddy, Art Gleason, during another uh, ball game together after a layoff of a couple of years, and we hope we'll see Art around the circuit a lot more. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, now uh, Dizzy Dean and Gene Kirby will be at uh, Everett Field to bring you the ball game out of Everett Field, and we sincerely hope you'll be tuned in at that time. And now this is Al Helfer, Jimmy Park in Chicago, saying in just 60 minutes, 60 seconds, I'll be back with the camel scoreboard over most of these stations. The Falstaff Brewing Corporation of St. Louis, Omaha, New Orleans, and San Jose. Brewers of premium quality Falstaff beer and their distributors everywhere have joined in bringing you Mutual's Game of the Day. <laughs>